Ah, uh, fucking damn it. Typo. Hi, Kairos. How you doing? Oh, uh, let's see here. Let's... Say, <laughs> and we'll add that. Boom, working on Melange FFI, S tier, and Dune RPC TypeScript. Twitch.tv slash DMM Mulroy. There we go. That's the tweet we wanted. All right. Let's get started here. Let me check in on Discord. Oh, I have to fix my screen. Okay, that should be fixed there. Let's bump up the font size. Okay, and let me go check my Discord messages real quick. Cool, so one of the first things I wanna knock out today is um, right now I have an issue with how we're doing brands in Melange FFI where uh, this T value right here is causing um, incorrect types to be reported, right? So this X, it thinks, well, maybe a better name for this is uh, my result. My result thinks there's an X on it because the way we're branding results is we're saying it's a T and a brand. Um, and this X doesn't actually exist. Um, so our options are to either create types for the actual underlying melange representation of data. Or we do something like um, our result type would look something more like, uh, let's see here. If we went in here, it would end up looking more like, um, Yeah, it would look like this. <laughs> and that would obscure the underlying data structures. What up, Zavi? 
Zav, Zav Ai, don't know how to say your name, but welcome. I don't know how to get rid of that diagnostic or what diagnostic that's actually coming from. It's probably coming from Prettier, maybe? Or maybe it's coming from TS Server, I'm not sure. Um, LSP stop TS. Yeah, it's coming from TS Server, okay. All right, let's see how void impacts us here. This needs to get published soon anyways, because I wrote a bunch of tests. And I think my, um, if we go run our test, I think my um, list tests aren't fully getting run. So if we do bun test, yeah, my list module is not getting entirely run. So let's go fix that problem before we publish a new version. Uh, list test. Okay, we have some errors in here. Right, so should retrieve the correct element for a valid index in a non. That's good. This might just be a case of unknown can we annotate this as an any and yeah there we go and then we're upset down here too that's weird that it's not inferring that as an any and rather is inferring it as an unknown but that's okay because we can come in here and just annotate our test with an any what up what up bio what up angel so is there an only in here? Yep, there it is. I knew it. Uh, let's look for another one. Okay, so now we should have more than 54 tests run. Uh, I don't think I saved though, there we go. So clear, bun test, test, there we go, 106 tests. 9,733 assertions. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. There's some other stuff I want to add before a 1.0 release of Melange FFI. So I wanna go add those while I'm thinking about it. Let's just add like a to do, add function dot flip. 
I also want to go look what's in the OCaml standard library under their function module. Oops, that's not what I want. OCaml.org. Can be white screen for a second. There we go. Function, 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 function. Fun. There we go. Const ID. Identity would potentially be a useful one to have. Protect finally work invokes work and then finally before work returns with its value or an exception. In the latter case, exception is re-raised after finally if finally raised an exception. Then the exception finally raised is raised instead. Protect can be used to enforce local invariance whether work returns normally or raises an exception. However, it does not protect against unexpected exceptions raised inside finally, such as out of memory stack overflow I actually don't know how that, I don't fully understand this. Protect finally work invokes work, which is some function that takes no argument and returns an A, and that A is the result of protect. Invokes work and then finally before work returns with its value or an exception. In the latter case, the exception is re-raised after finally. I actually don't know when or how you'd want to use this. I'm not fully understanding this. Give me some examples. All right, so they're saying we acquire some resource and we call protect. And we have this finally where we release. So it's like a deferred function. How do exceptions play into this function? Mm -hmm. If work completes without raising the exception, the return value is captured. doesn't do exactly what I would want it to, right? So 
also if work raises protect will always re-raise is that correct that's probably not the functionality I want right it's too okay so this is basically just here to make sure that something happens for sure So really, we'd want some sort of function that looked like, I don't even know if it's important to include. It'd be like, let try, and it would be like, oh, let's write this in OCaml, val try, That's close, but rather than this being an option, it would be more like a result. And this would be something like that. Does this seem like a reasonable uh, function definition to Actually, this, that's not right. That's not right at all. It would be this. Sorry, I meant this definition. What up, one bite? Mm, yeah, yep, 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 yep. Oh, that's an even better idea. Beautiful, that's exactly what we wanted. And we could do something like, um... yeah, okay, I like that. Does that seem reasonable? What's up, Pascal? How you doing?
Maybe we could take some inspiration from that protect function where it has the finally. So then we'd have like um, something like finally. Camel, this would end up looking like, let's say this is try catch, get an A, and then we could have this would be um, uh, finally, which would be um, unit to unit. Something like this. I think function.const is pretty useful too. Let's actually go look at the Gleam docs since I've taken a bunch of inspiration from them. Flip, identity, and tap. Oh, compose could be a useful one. Constant, so I like that. So what do they do with uh, tap? Takes an argument and a single function, calls the function with that argument, and returns that argument instead of the I could see that being useful. Describe what up, Mohib? The world. Thank you for the follow, Shalzo. Appreciate you. And oh man, I'm gonna put your name, Shahid Jayas. Thank you, thank you. So function one is A to B and then B to C. So we probably want to compose function. Can you do a stream one day on how you set up your Neovim? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. Um, thinking about if I would, would want to do that right now. Would you want to watch that right now? 
It does work in Nix. Yep, NeoVim is in Nix. Okay, um, let me publish a new version of Melange FFI and then um, we'll take a, a brief like 30 minutes or so to go over my NeoVim setup. Compose. Um, okay, so we have all of that. Yeah, no problem, Wahid. Um, okay, so we want to, we changed our uh, result, right? To have void in here. So let's see. If we can go do that with, we probably want to do that in list too. These are probably all going to be part of the problem. Yeah, this is going to need to be void. Why in this file does it not get upset about that T not being used? But in result, it was like, yo dog. Gotta use, gotta use it. Like that seems super inconsistent, right? Whatever. Okay. Um, And option is the other one. So this also needs to be void here. And here it complains. Why did it not complain in list? Weird. Okay, whatever. And that the brand's coming from the same file in every place. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Um, add tests, update brand types. Let's go ahead and do a, let's do another test to make sure everything's good. Everything passes, great. Let's do a, I think I have a cat package JSON. I think we have a script to publish here, publish patch, yep. Uh, bun run publish patch, bada bing bada boom, uh oh. Why would that happen? Looks like we're gonna have to do a cast somewhere. List 246. Oh, <laughs> we have 33 type errors in here, right. Hmm. Argument of some T is not assignable to parameter of type T, okay. List.head, does list.head return a T, I bet? It does. <laughs> hmm. It's not quite what we want. Hey. Hmm. Um, I'm gonna just pay the HOA dues. Okay. And then update our reoccurring. 
Oh, to cover that extra four bucks? Yeah, because how dumb is it that I can't make a credit card payment unless it's at least $15? That's really stupid. And that the reoccurring pay, like we didn't get a notice about our reoccurring payment not like sinking with our HOA dues after they Fuck the HOA is what I Fuck have to Fuck the say. HOA. Hi, Belka. You're very pretty. Thank you. You're just a big polar bear. Come on. Let's go. But okay, I just want to make sure that's fine. So maybe our approach in here is rather than using our actual function that, um, where's head at? Function head. This can raise, right? Yeah. So as long as you're not passing a um, hmm. How does the melange runtime implement reduce? Well, I guess they call it fold, right? It's gonna be fold left. Yeah, maybe we just do that. So we'll do just list that head. Is it a lost Me so rare. Can I cast this in line? How do I cast this in the middle of a function? Uh, TypeScript. Do I have to reassign it? Okay, fine, whatever. So if we do that, we'll come in here and we'll just say like const, uh, no, we don't want const. We'll say let internal list or casted list Um, equals list as any. Am I really going to do this? How is it being, uh, right, maybe we don't need that. Yeah, okay. And this would be a place where we say to do consider writing types for um, Melange's runtime representation 
of lists, results, options. And we'll go uppercase on that. That didn't work. There we go. Okay. And then let's make sure that um, that's not what we want either. That's going to be tail dot list. Uh, list dot tail. Casted list dot tail. There we go. That was almost no bug. Uh, let's run our test and make sure we're good. Uh, bun test. Two failed. Okay. What did we fail on? Reduce. Now, why did that break? <laughs> like that should be fine, right? Because our head function is just passing to this and wrapping it in an option. Tail is effectively doing the same thing. So how is this any different than what we had? Other than getting sums. Um, let's go look at the test, I guess. And we're failing on which tests? Should accumulate correctly for non-empty lists. That looks fine. And what's it saying is, uh, Undefined is not an object. So how is this any different than Melange did it? Sorry, my bad. <clears throat> This shouldn't take too awfully long. We just have to figure out this reduce bug and then we'll jump into new of M stuff. Fold left. While true, the list equals the list that gets passed in. Our accumulator is the accumulator, which is the initial value. If our list evaluates to zero, or if our list is falsy, we return the accumulator. Otherwise, our list equals the tail. What up, noons?
So we call function f with the accumulator and the list.head. They assign the list. No, that's the old list. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. What am I doing wrong here? We get our list. We start an index at zero. Let's uh let's open up their implementation again over here. Uh, where was it? It was list MJS. Yeah, this guy. I'm gonna go to reduce or fold left, I guess. All right, so we want to compare this function with what's on the left right here. While true, the extra work we do is keep track of our index. So the way uh, lists in Melange or our, our linked list, the way we know we're at the very, at the last node in the linked list is that tail will be zero. So when tail is zero, we assign it to casted list. And the next time through the loop, we get to this if statement, it's zero. It's like, oh, this is a false value, flips it, evaluates to true, and we return the accumulator. So that feels fine. Um, Yo, what up, 6412? And then we pass in the head of the casted list. Right, this needs to be casted list. That's probably the bug right there. Boom. That was in fact the issue. In fact, we could probably make this a little bit more type safe and be like, um, a head, which will be a T, and then a tail, which will be a T, or it will be the same structure. So, should really make it tight for this. Um, melange list, yeah. It's not generic. Yes, it is. It's going to be. Okay. So let's um Okay. That looks a little bit better. Uh, actually, not quite. This is actually going to be or zero. And then this will, I guess, be or zero. Or really, we can do it here to be a little bit more precise. Yeah, there we go. Look at that, simple linked list type. Oh, I'm out of coffee. <coughs> Shit. Is my uh, mic peaking, anyone? Or do we sound good on volume levels? You good? Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Cool, thank you.
Okay, so that looks good. Let's do a model voice to go with the model face. Thank you. My ego doesn't need inflated though. It's already big enough. All right, perfect. All our tests passed. Let's add, get commit, um, update, reduce, uh, enable all of list tests, and git push. Perfect. And let's do a MP bun publish. Hopefully this runs now. Publish patch. Great. Let me go to FA, get this published, and then we'll upgrade S tier, publish a new version of S tier, um, and then we'll check our types in S tier testing. <laughs> okay, we already made the font size bigger. Great, uh, that's published. Let's jump over, let's give that a push. And let's go to S tier. And um, what file is this in? We want to get rid of this. And we want to npm, no. Do we have uh, Melange FFI pinned at the moment? No, latest. So if we do a bun, and a bun update, we're going to pick up. Did we just publish 20? Yeah, we did, okay. So let's do a build here. Uh, bump melange FFI and we'll do bun publish patch. Frack. Okay. <laughs> so this is saying our problem is in our dist. There's literally nothing in there. Oh, it's in build default source index.ts. And our error here is argument of type list t is not assignable. And list requires that actually might be wrong. Hold on, let me think about this. I think I have my types wrong in here. Yeah, I do. Okay. Okay, so in here, um, what are we looking for in here? That's fine. This is wrong. We need, this is gonna be not an array. This is going to be a list. 
uh, here. And uh, what is this? This will be the same thing. Whoops. The help. Okay, and we'll do the same here. We probably need to import list. A rest parameter must be of type, okay, yeah, whatever. Is this what we actually want though? Is now what I'm wondering. It's potentially we might need to wrap this. No, I think that's okay. I think that's okay, actually. Okay, I think that might be okay. So let's go ahead and do a doom clean and we'll do a doom build. And now let's go back to our default directory. <laughs> Argument of type list T is not assigned to parameter of type S expression. Yeah, Meta, we're going to be in uh, TypeScript land all day today. Monday morning, we're going to be back in OCaml land. Um, I'm going to start splitting up my week between uh, the rewrite for Mint T and uh, some of this Melange stuff. So, like, maybe. You know, like Tuesday, Thursdays are mint tea days, and then Monday, Wednesday, Friday are melange work. <laughs> so what does this think it is? Uh, sure. Let x equal that. So we end up getting, this should be a list of S expressions, right? Did we break our inference even worse now? Uh, I said that we're going to be writing uh, TypeScript all day today, but then on Monday, um, we're gonna spend a full stream on getting mint tea planned. That might take multiple days, but then I think I'm gonna start doing um, like two days of mint tea rewrite during the week and three days of melange work, uh, especially since there's gonna be people helping with the rewrite. Like maybe we'll start off doing PR reviews in the morning and then pivot to other work on the days that we don't focus on mint tea or the CMA mint tea rewrite. So this should have got inferred to be a list of numbers and it didn't. You see this? It did not carry through that T to there, which is problematic. 
So our types are busted. <laughs> That's fucking horrible. I can't tell if TS server is just being a dick here. Yeah, okay, so branded types are hard. Trying to force TypeScript to use nominal types is a pain in the dick. All right, before we tackle this problem, let's go do my NeoVim run through. Are you uh, still around, Mohaid? Okay, cool. I might try to publish this to YouTube too. Title tags, add stream. What did I do? Uh, how do I get out of edit mode? Do I just refresh? Okay. So, um, okay. So we're gonna start here. Let's rename this to NeoVim. Yeah, I'm gonna have Kyle clip this up and publish it as a video. Um, let me also kind of plan out here how I wanna walk through this. So let's, uh, this is not what I want. Let's do a vnew and let's say um, directory setup. Uh, yoink. Actually, I'm gonna uh, write this in Markdown. NeoVim walkthrough. And we'll say, um, just disclaimer about Nix plus link to GitHub. And then we'll say, uh, directory Functions structure describe the world uh, plus lazy dot mvim do I use lazy dot mvim okay which one's the yeah lazy mvim is the plugin manager uh, then we'll go over uh, options keybinds uh, maybe we, yeah, we'll do those first. Or let's do plugins between there. Plus more on lazy. Options, plugins, keybinds, uh, custom stuff.
And let's also call out tmux. All right, let me yoink this, throw this in a note on my other screen. So I have like kind of a little plan here. Uh, my key, yeah, you got the keyboard command. Um, yeah, if y'all decide to stick around and hang out, you are able to spend a thousand bytes or points on a chance to win a Keychron. Oh. Did that not finish? Did that not go the whole way through? Did we break it by running it at the same time? My, uh, my thing might be broken. So we're just gonna disable that for right now. Let me see how I can, uh, how do I give points back to somebody? Does anyone know how to do that? Refund, is that an option? Uh, my bot for the Keychron broke. I don't know how to, I don't know how to give somebody points. Hmm. I know it's possible to do. We'll try to fix that after uh, we go through NeoVim. Pull, pin, monitor, unmonitor, unmod, mod, mass unban, marker, goal. Yeah, I don't know how to do it. I need to drag a cable to my Apple TV. It stutters when watching your stream at 1440p. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I admittedly don't know how to like refund points. Oh, hold on. I got it. Okay. Yeah, something's broken with my points. Boom. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to go fix that. All right, so we're just gonna do a quick walkthrough of my new event. Let me get started here. This one's for uh, Mohaid. Okay, so I often get asked about uh, my NeoVim and my NeoVim configuration, so I figured I'd do a quick little walkthrough. Um, 
let me first, all my dot files and configuration can be found on my GitHub, which will be here and we'll get a link in the description. But you can find my dot files at dmmulroy slash kickstart.nix. Um, currently I'm managing all of my uh, uh, setup with Nix, but I still uh, use Lua and all that for my NeoVim and anyone who uses NeoVim normally should be able to uh, copy this. So if you go to kickstart slash config, drop into the NVM or NVim directory, all of my setups here, uh, and you can pretty much just copy paste that and dump that into your own project. I've also tried to take a lot of care and effort um, to comment a lot of my uh, Lua configuration to explain what's going on. I had originally started this repo on my Envim configuration using uh, TJ DeVries's um, kickstart uh, .envim project and then slowly expanded out from there. So everything should be pretty uh, idiomatic and standard. But yeah, let's uh, let's jump in, shall we? So if we look here, this is the root level directory in my config. Uh, it's pretty straightforward and bare bones and basic. Um, I use lazy.envim as my package manager, which is what this lazy lock file is. The entry point to my dot files is gonna be this init.lua, which really just requires my uh, specific user configuration. Um, whoops, we didn't wanna do that. Let's go back here. Now I'm getting all over the place. Let's get back into our file tree, go up a couple of directories. So in the root level, we have these two directories after, which is the typical NeoVim after directory. Um, you can read the NeoVim docs for what that directory is used for, but like the too long didn't read is, that's the last thing. Um, the files in the after directory is like the last stage of bootstrapping NeoVim. So uh, things you'll find in here are gonna be um, things for detecting specific syntaxes or file types. Um, I have some, some things set up for ReasonML and uh, OCaml. And then the majority of my configuration lives within uh, Lua, which if you recall, we import user. So if we go back and go look in Lua, we have user and then this init.lua. That's what this outside file is requiring. If we look in here, uh, we basically funnel everything else up through this uh, user init in the, the top level init, and that's kind of how my NeoVim bootstraps itself. So in here, we bring in my options, uh, all our plugins, um, which our plugins are loaded via this user.lazy module, uh, my key maps, and then I have a bunch of uh, custom uh, plugins, if you will, um, or just like little uh, scripts that I've written in Lua that uh, make my editor experience exactly how I want it. So to start, let's jump into my options. That's probably gonna be the most important. Uh, as I said, I try to, like, I've tried to comment mostly everything in here um, for what it does and what it controls. So I personally enjoy having relative line numbers so I can see, for instance, like, um, Let's have a better example. Right now I'm on line 13, but maybe I want to jump 10 up. So I can just say 10K and I jump up there. So that's what relative line numbers does. Um, I set up tabs to spaces. I turn on auto indenting with these options. Um, I turn on some smart indenting and have a link to stack overflow for why we need this. Uh, we have incremental searching. I disable uh, text wrap kind of across the board. I use my spacebar as my leader key. Um, so any of my key binds that are prefixed with leader, I am pressing spacebar and then my key bind to activate those. I set up how I want uh, things to be split. So when I'm doing things like a vertical split or a horizontal split, um, those settings control that. I turn on mouse mode, so right, we can come in here can do all that. I rarely ever use that, but I do prefer to have it on. Uh, we enable some settings for uh, 
casing. This mostly is to help um, searching. I actually have no idea what up uptime or update times does. So let's see here. Uh, looks like this is just for writing the swap file. Uh, we set some autocomplete options, our undo file, we update to 24 bit color. We have our sign column, um, which is this guy over here. So it's always going to be enabled, not just when plugins decide to put something there. I really hate having this off uh, because if you have it off and you go into a buffer or you're working in a buffer where let's say you make a edit to Git and suddenly Git wants to put symbols in there, it's going to push your buffer to the right. I think that's really annoying. Uh, we enable access integration with the system clipboard. Uh, we put a cursor line on, which is basically this line right here. It moves with what line my cursor's on, just easier for me to at a quick glance see where I'm at. Uh, we set up some fold settings, and this is mostly to work with one of our um, plugins. So I'm not sure if I can fold anything in here. Yeah, um, we'll go over folding a little bit later, but these are recommended settings for folds. Um, from Endem UFO, which is the plugin I use for managing my folds. Uh, then scroll off is basically what keeps the buffer. Um, I almost just pointed at the screen like an idiot. Um, there's always at minimum eight lines above or eight lines below me as I'm scrolling through my files. That is what this does. Uh, the column line is just this over here. It's pretty standard nowadays to have a uh, column width of 80 characters. Um, so I just keep that as the default. Uh, do we have the sign column in here twice? We do. So we don't need that. Uh, we don't need this sit setting anymore because I don't use Kitty anymore. I use Ghosty. And then right now I have this setting here. Uh, most of you won't need this. And I'm not even sure if I need this anymore, but this is to customly configure the blinking of my cursor. Um, I was having some issues in Tmux and Gus Ghosty that I need to revisit. Um, but for now, it works reasonably well. Um, each thing's commented on what it does. And yeah, hopefully I can remove that sometime soon. So the next thing uh, I want to go through is our actual plugins. So if you recall, if we look in our user init, we bring our plugins in through this lazy module and we're managing all our plugins with lazy. So let's go take a look at lazy.lua. If we look at lazy.lua, this is gonna look super similar to your, if you use Packer, um, we basically just set up where uh, lazy can put data. We uh, install lazy if it's not already installed, um, make sure it's in Vim's runtime path, uh, actually load the plugin and then we set it up and we import plugins. This is going to go look in a directory of this name. So to actually get all of our new Vim plugins, we keep it in a directory called plugins. Um, and if you're not familiar with lazy, lazy ends up looking like this. You get a command that you can run and it's going to bump up this window and your view, you're going to get all the plugins you have loaded in your system, which you can see I have quite a few. And then some of them haven't loaded in yet because I haven't needed to use them. That's one nice property of Lazy is you can really configure it to not load plugins until you need them. Hence the name Lazy, Lazy Loading. Um, that can help with startup times if you use a lot of plugins. We can come in here and we can do things like, uh, we can check if any of our plugins have updates. Uh, looks like I do. So let's read through these quick. Some new updates to tree sitter. Great. Some updates to dressing, some updates to Lua line. Great. These all look good. So if we go back up to the top, we can go ahead and run update or sync. So I'm just going to run sync and that will update everything for me. Um, one nice thing about um, this is you can also profile it to see how fast your uh, editor starts up. So if you press P, you can see that uh, NeoVim in total starts up in 77 milliseconds for me. And you can kind of see when and where plugins get loaded and Lazy gives you a bunch of options on how to configure that. 
Um, I could spend time getting this even lower, but um, I don't notice really any problems with my startup time at the moment. So that's lazy. So now let's go take a tour of my actual plugins. So if you recall, uh, in our current file, we're looking for a plugins directory. That's where lazy's looking. And it is looking right here, this plugins directory. So this, I uh, have a file for um, most of my um, plugins. So we have auto pairs and uh, uh, my completion stuff. So if we come in here and look, we load in the typical NVIM autocomplete um, plugin and this plugin is going to load uh, when the buffer read post event fires or the buffer new file fire event fires, excuse me. We have a handful of dependencies in this. So we have things like uh, integrating with our LSP, getting completions from our buffer, getting file path completions, getting snippet completions, um, some other stuff that make our snippets better. Let's see here. LSP kind, if I recall correctly, gives me icons in our autocomplete. So if we look here, like, I don't know. If, yeah, so these icons here, that's where uh, LSP kind is feeding in. Let's delete that. And then um, NVIM auto pairs is uh, gonna be a plugin that like automatically closes our brackets or strings. Um, so you can see like when I press these, I'm getting like the equivalent closing of it. So that's what NVIM auto pairs does. Walking through our configuration of this stuff. Um, I probably won't go too in the weeds with a lot of this stuff, um, cause it's pretty specific to me, but, uh, here we're just setting up how, um, auto completes and, um, our pop-ups work. So setting key bindings here so I can like basically go through my list of key bindings. I can open it pressing control space, control J and K move me up and down through the list. I think I can also use tab and shift tab. Yep. So that's what you're seeing here. That functionality that we just covered is what those key binds does or do, excuse me. Um, if we have hover docs for a particular function that sets this up. And this configures our sources for actual autocomplete. So we get first and foremost sources from our LSP, and then we get sources from Copilot, and then uh, stuff out of the local buffer, which I think I want to replace these um, around. Copilot, file paths, and then our snippets. This configures some of our formatting, um, adds basically just, um, you know, the symbols generally. And then ghost text is like what will give the, this is the ghost text here from our autocomplete plugin. It's not actually in the buffer, but if we accepted that, that's what it's gonna give us. So that's our autocomplete plugin and all of its dependencies. Moving on our color scheme. Uh, I use Capuchin Macchiato, no idea if I said that correctly but the plugin for Capuchin actually is super nice because it lets you um, automatically apply your color theme to a bunch of really common plugins. Um, so this handles applying my theme across all of that for me. And then down here, we just set our color theme. And um, this little bit right here, um, I'm not sure if I need it anymore. Um, NeoVim, was doing some changes to semantic highlights and it was uh, giving me some weird visual effects. So I just turned it off. I need to go back and revisit this to see if I still need it. Moving on, our comment plugin. This just lets me do things like if I press uh, GCC, it's gonna comment on a line. Or if I have a giant selection and I do GCC, gonna do the same thing. We can also do blocks of comments. So if I highlight all this and I do GB, It'll do a block comment, pretty straightforward. Um, we also configure um, TS context comment string. I believe if I recall, um, this helps um, integrate tree sitter 
into our commenting. Next is Copilot. Um, I can probably remove this first Copilot plugin nowadays. I don't really use it anymore. And I've changed to using our Copilot uh, complete um, or Copilot integrated with my autocomplete rather than Copilot being it's like standalone UI and such. Um, so in fact, let's actually just get rid of this plugin because we don't need it anymore. Save that. Next up is dressing. Dressing is a plugin which um, just gives some of the UI a little bit better of an appearance. So for example, like the borders around this pop-up window and like down here in my autocomplete, um, that's what dressing does. Fidget is a little plugin that's being rewritten right now. So if I press format or save, you'll see this stuff down here in the corner loading. This is what Fidget does. Um, so that's all Fidget is. Git signs is gonna be the plugin that adds um, changes to our sidebar for if you're in a Git controlled repo. This is a new line, so you know, super, not super exciting. Um, Harpoon, I use Harpoon all the time. Uh, Harpoon is a plugin that like I can Harpoon this file. So if I press spacebar HA, this will be in here now and I can quickly navigate it to it. So to demonstrate this, let's add the previous file we're in. So if I press spacebar HA and then I do spacebar HO, we can see our Harpoon menu. I now have two files Harpooned. If I were to click on uh, the first one, that would jump us back and forth. Spacebar HO, we are in here again. I can go back here. And now I have key bindings for up to five Harpoon files. So if I press spacebar one, it's gonna take me to the first Harpoon file. If I press spacebar two, whoops, I waited too long there. Spacebar two, it's gonna jump me back and forth there. Um, I can do, you can edit this menu in here, like you can just delete one out, save it, um, or you can just move them back and forth, right? And that will change the key bindings and everything. Pretty nice plugin. I use that a lot for jumping around file buffers that uh, if I'm working on a feature and maybe I have like a types definition file and a implementation file and a testing file, I'll harpoon all of those and just be able to quickly navigate back and forth between them. After Harpoon, we've got Illuminate. Illuminate is gonna be the plugin that uh, highlights um, if there's more than one symbol uh, with what you're hovered over, I'll highlight it. So you can see I'm highlighted over this here and highlights it down there. If we jump back to a file that has two imports, maybe here, um, let's see here. Yeah, here's a great example. We have multiple require, require statements. When I go over require, it highlights all the other ones. And I think I have, if I press spacebar, open bracket, I can jump back and forth behind all the different symbols underneath my cursor. Um, I'm actually looking to replace this with um, a different plugin, um, but I haven't yet. It functionally does the same thing. Um, but sometimes this Illuminate plugin doesn't work well in OCaml files, which I write a lot of. Um, so I'm looking to potentially replace it. So that's Illuminate. Indent blank line. Um, that's what's going to configure these lines over here, I think. Or I actually can't even remember what this does. Mm -hmm. Enable, show start. Yeah, I think that just helps with it by our like, line indentation and this over here, these lines. Then my LSP setup. So we use NVIM LSP config. Uh, it loads when we uh, get done reading a buffer into memory. Uh, it has a couple available commands with it. We have some dependencies. So Mason is a UI for installing LSPs. So you can come in here and update and install new uh, language servers. So that's pretty convenient and nice. Just updating some at the time. Then we have um, a plugin, which is probably already loaded in from our um, autocomplete, but this 
lets us bind our LSP with autocomplete. None LS is gonna let us have LSP servers for things like ESLint, prettier um, formatters, things of that nature. NeoDev is just gonna make writing NeoVim code a little bit nicer for us. And then Fidget, again, um, probably don't need it in here, but it is a dependency, is what uh, gives us that nice little UI down here. Um, nothing super exciting in here, just some custom stuff. So there's some messages I don't wanna see from TS Server. Um, these are some messages I just like, um, these are some info diagnostics I just don't care to see from TS Server. So I just have a list of the things I don't wanna see. And then I intercept uh, TS Server's stuff and I filter those out. That's all we're doing there. This is a list of all the servers we want installed automatically for us um, with some configuration on them. This is gonna be super specific to uh, your individual like workflow and what languages you work with. So here we integrate, here's the code where we actually like bind our uh, LSP to um, the LS or the autocomplete stuff. Let's see here. I had this function uh, where we integrate our LSP with some keybinds, which this function comes from our actual keybinds file, which we'll go over in a little bit. Uh, we set up a command for just running formatting. Um, and if you're a TypeScript dev specifically, um, I have this set up in such a way that um, if you're using both TS Server and Prettier, it's going to default to using Prettier to format your code rather than TS Server. That way you don't get like a format from Prettier and then also a second format from TS Server. And then we just loop through our servers in that block above, register them all. Um, here's where we set up null s, which null s is what gives us LSP-like capabilities for things like Prettier and ESLint. Um, we set up some styling. We say we want Prettier, style Lua, OCaml format. We set up um, diagnostics for ESLint. Um, we set up code actions for ESLint, pretty straightforward, um, some styling stuff, and that's the extent of my LSP stuff. It's probably the most complicated piece I have. Next is Lua line. So your uh, Lua line is going to be this bar of information down at the bottom. I have, um, did I write this? Oh, right. I wrote a custom uh, Harpoon integration with um, Lua line. So you can see down here that has this little Harpoon, a dash slash two. So this is telling me that I have two Harpoon files in this project and the current file I'm in is not one of them. If I were to add this to my Harpoon, you see that just incremented. I pressed spacebar HA to add this buffer to my Harpoon list, which you'll see it's there now. And down here, you can see that we're in our third file. So that tells me if I want to get back to this file, I can press spacebar three. We go here, spacebar one, spacebar, sorry, spacebar two, spacebar one, and to go back, spacebar three. So that's how that little Harpoon integration works. Um, I had this for work. Previously, um, it will also show your Git branch down here. You can see we're in main. This basically just like intercepts uh, that data. And uh, we had a naming convention at work to name our branches like this. So I basically just parsed out the ticket number and then made it uh, a custom branch name. So it didn't take up a ton of room. This is how you write a custom component for Lululine. Like I said, this is like all the Harpoon integration is. We brought in the marks API from Harpoon. We got the total number of marks. If there's no marks, we just return an empty string. Uh, we set the current mark to a dash, and then we go ahead and check if the current buffer is one of the marks. And if so, we just spit out the string right here, which you'll see like this is literally that right there. 
And then we follow the standard Lua line setup and add all the pieces we care about. In my case, I care about my Git branch, my Harpoon, uh, the diff, diagnostics, um, our file name, and our file type, which is gonna be over here. Markdown preview, this is super cool. I just learned about this, I think from Rond recently. Um, I have a command in my editor that um, loads when I go to a markdown file. So if we just quickly make a markdown file in here, markdown.md, we save that, we go in here, let's just say, hello world, we save, and I run markdown preview. This is gonna open a tab and it's gonna have that in there. And it actually scrolls with you, does live updating. Check this out, like, and we can just, you can see it stays in sync with your editor. Super cool, very useful for editing markdown files. Let's delete that. Next is NVIM notify. Um, NVIM notify is gonna give us a uh, little pop-up over here when asynchronous things are running. So for example, if I run this, like this error message right here, that is the kind of UI that um, and then notify gives us. And then um, I just have some custom overrides and things of that nature in here. Some custom styling, uh, nothing super exciting. Next is MDIM Tmux Navigator. So I also use Tmux and this lets me uh, essentially um, switch between Neovim panes and Tmux panes. So if I were to open a new Tmux pane to the right, so I'll Tmux open to the right. So over here, we're outside of Neovim, but I can press Control H and Control L to jump back and forth between these. Same with Control um, J and K if we had buffers or panes above and below. And one of the other nice things is um, that is not what I meant to do, but sure. We can close this back over here. Let's close this window on the left. Cool. So that just gives us integration between Tmux and NeoVim. Uh, next is this, which I am not even using right now. So we can probably just delete this entirely. Uh, next up is oil. Oil is what I use for uh, browsing my uh, file directory. I don't use a file tree. You might have seen me already pop open this view. This is oil. This is how I navigate around my projects and explore them. It lets you treat uh, your file tree as an actual like text buffer. So you've already seen me create a markdown file. Like I can just say file.txt, save that. Yep, want to create it. Boom, I can delete it. Um, I could go paste it in here. You know, this is what oil is. You can also configure it to open in a buffer. So if we do a new split over here and then run oil, we get a buffer that doesn't go away rather than the floating one. And then these are just my key maps um, for oil. I highly, highly, highly recommend oil over a file tree. Uh, we also have Spectre. So Spectre is going to be a global find and replace plugin. Um, so I can launch into Spectre like this. It gives us a UI over here. This will grep across your whole project. So let's say we want to search for dependencies, right? And let's say we wanted to change this to uh, depths across the entire project. Um, we could do that. I'm obviously not going to do that, but this shows us all our changes where it would change. Um, so super Super useful plugin that I use all the time. Next up is symbols outline. Um, this is gonna give us exactly what it sounds like, a symbol outline. So if I press leader SO, uh, it gives us a actual symbol outline on the left over here. We can expand it, uh, step into stuff. Yeah, you're just typical symbol outline, nothing too exciting. Next up is Telescope. Um, this is probably like my most used plugin. Uh, 
if you're not familiar with Telescope, which I, it's like one of the foundational plugins in NeoVim, this is gonna be our fuzzy finder. So if I do like spacebar SF, it's gonna let me search for files across my entire project, um, filter it down. I can also search uh, my open buffers. I can search just a whole bunch of different things. It lets you fuzzy find across in that UI I just showed. Um, so this is how that's configured. Next is tree sitter. Tree sitter is what's gonna give us really awesome highlighting and basically parses our buffers into abstract syntax trees and enables um, other plugins to read and interact with those uh, syntax trees. In fact, can we, I forget what the plugin is here. There's a way to inspect, yeah, inspect tree. So here is what the current files uh, tree sitter syntax tree ends up looking like. So plugins will use this tree to highlight things, syntax highlighting, edit files. One of the most useful plugins in the NeoVim ecosystem. And then this, um, I'm not sure if it's worth uh, talking about um, all these settings because they're pretty specific to me. Um, yeah, I would just say read the docs on this one. There's a lot you can configure with this. Um, there's a good chance you're going to want this installed. It's all right, uh, Colchis and chat. Uh, this is going to be posted to YouTube. Uh, next is tsc.mm. This is my own uh, plugin. Uh, this lets you get uh, asynchronous. In fact, you saw me run this earlier. We're not in a TypeScript project right now, but this plugin will run asynchronous, non-blocking, project-wide type checking on a TypeScript project. Um, I might be able to demonstrate this quickly if we jump over to, uh, let's say we go to this project, Vim in here, let's just go to source, and we can come in Actually, let's go into result. Uh, yep, we can open a read only. So TS server should spin up if we do. Oh, it didn't find that. Interesting. Um, I think this is because I'm running inside a Nix and I haven't fixed this yet. But either way, in most normal setups, it will type check across your TypeScript projects. Next up is UFO. This is my uh, code folding plugin so we can come in here and like fold this right that's basically what this does um just sets up some custom folding next up is vim maximizer so if i have two windows open um if i press spacebar m it'll maximize it or minimize the other or maximize the current pane i'm in and i can press it again to uh have them equal out so very little setup for that plugin. Vim Surround uh, is a plugin where let's say I have um, some text, I can say yank YSIW and then brackets and it will surround it with brackets. I can also do that or I can delete surround, all sorts of things like that. So that's what that plugin does. And finally, Wilder. Um, Wilder is what controls uh, command mode in NeoVim. So command mode is this guy down here. This is gonna give me like fuzzy finding and better autocompletes and some different UIs. Um, so that's what Wilder does. And then I have some just styling and custom setups that I've found useful. So that's all my plugins. Um, it's quite a few, but it's still pretty lightweight. Like I said, I have a 77 second or 75 second. Can you imagine a 77 second startup time? 77 millisecond startup time. Uh, the next thing we're gonna cover is my keybinds. So let's, what is this Visual Studio? Yeah, can you imagine what the startup time of like NeoVim with a bunch of plugins is? Probably literal seconds. So my key maps are gonna be under here. And again, this is a file I've tried to uh, comment pretty heavily. 
So maybe one useful thing to cover first is I have these key map utils, which I actually think I'm gonna rip out. I copied this from Primogen originally, um, but I think I'm gonna get rid of them when I get some free time. But to go look at what my key map utils look like, um, I basically just give myself convenient methods for uh, mapping different key combinations in Vim's various modes, whether that's normal mode, which is what we're in now, insert mode when we're typing, uh, command mode, um, things like that. So that's all these do. Um, nothing super exciting. Some of them are non-recursive, which means it won't override um, underlying keybinds. But let's jump in. Uh, so we disable spacebar since we're using it as our uh, leader key. Um, our first section is all our normal mode key mappings. In fact, I don't use kitty anymore, so we can get rid of our kitty. Well, you know what? I'm not going to edit this now, but I switched from using kitty standalone with no tmux to using ghosty with tmux. So that's kind of what this is doing here. This enables my keybinds to uh, switch between panes. So we can move in every direction, Control J, Control K, Control L, Control H. Um, I can press um, leader um, control up to switch between the last buffer, which is, you know, here. That's actually not what I would have expected. Um, I should probably change this, but Save with leader key, so I press spacebar W to save my buffer, leader Q to quit out of the buffer, uh, save and quit leader Z. I almost never use this key bind. I press leader E to open uh, a floating oil buffer. Um, I have a bunch of key maps for keeping my buffer centered when I navigate. So ZZ in NeoVim is a keybind to center your buffer around your cursor. So when I'm doing vertical movements, which are all captured here on the left, um, I update them to automatically center my buffer. So if I'm going up and down, it's always keeping my buffer centered. That's what these do. These are some of like my most important keybinds in my opinion. Um, let's see here. I can press leader capital S to launch into find and replace. Um, I can, oh, that was that one. If I just do capital S, it'll put me down here to, uh, find and replace in the current buffer. And then leader capital F, uh, launches me into specter. Um, I don't use this often, but that's I think pretty equivalent. It would, oh, that's overridden. So this doesn't even work at the moment. Uh, looks like I have a duplicated block there. So we can delete that. Let me write it to do fix. Currently being overridden by telescope. Yep, thank you. Uh, I have two keybinds for jumping to the beginning and start of a line. So I use capital L and capital H to jump between uh, the start and beginning of lines. Uh, I use capital U for undo. So I can do undo there. And then this is actually more like redo. So if I come in here and I delete in between these, I can press... Uh, lowercase u to undo it, and then capital U to redo it. So I thought that was a pretty uh, nice convention. Uh, if I want to turn off highlights, so if I search for, let's just say, no recursive remap, you can look in here. And if I want to hide these highlights, I press spacebar, and O turns them off. Um, if we had diagnostics, I can uh, navigate around my buffer um, by pressing bracket D or bracket um, e bracket W, let me jump around my various diagnostics in my buffer. So D will take me to any diagnostic. E will just take me between my error di diagnostics, W for my warnings. 
Um, leader D opens my diagnostics. I don't have any right now. Maybe I can create one to demonstrate this. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that doesn't even appear to work at all. So this doesn't work. And I don't really use this anyway, so I don't think I want to keep this. Uh, we can place all our diagnostics into a quick fix list. I don't really ever use this. Um, I do use these quick fix list ones. So if I did have something in my, um, if we do spacebar LD, whoops, it's going to put all our diagnostics into this quick fix list. And I can navigate in my quick fix list from in the buffer by pressing spacebar CN, CN, or CP. Uh, I can close it by spacebar CC, whoops, CC, or reopen it with CO. So that's how I use my quick fix list. And let's go back and fix that. Uh, the maximizer toggle I talked about before, that's where if I have two buffer opens and I press spacebar M, it's going to maximize the current one I'm in. I can press leader M again to bring them back to equal widths. Um, uh, I can also use leader uh, arrow key to, um, or leader equal, excuse me, that was a weird uh, little ligature there. So if I go in here and I press leader spacebar, it'll set them to equal. So those kind of do the same thing. Spacebar F formats my current buffer. Uh, oh, this is one of the custom ones I wrote, which we'll go over in a little bit. So if I have two buffers open, uh, let's go to a different one actually. So I have my options in this open. I normally am always editing in my left buffer. If I press leader RW, it rotates them. RW um, is the mnemonic that I came up with. You know, it's short for rotate windows. So that's what that does. Uh, leader TC runs my uh, TypeScript type checker plugin that I built. And obviously the, the mnemonic there is uh, type check or TypeScript compile. So my harpoon keybinds, which we've talked about already, HO opens harpoon. HA adds the current one, HR removes it, HC clears all of it. See, if we did HC, whoops, HC, it's now empty. And then here's how I navigate between my harpooned files. Again, spacebar one, spacebar two, spacebar three, spacebar five. Um, we have some git key maps. I don't use these super often, um, but they are there nonetheless. So leader GF is basically going to just pull up a fuzzy finder in telescope for all my files that I have controlled with Git. Don't really use that. I normally just use uh, leader SF, which uh, searches all the files in the project. So getting into actual telescope keybinds, um, I can do leader question mark to uh, show my most recently opened files. Uh, leader SB, I also use quite frequently for all the buffers right now. Like I've been in every buffer. I've been in every file in this project, so this isn't really a good list to demonstrate, but it, this will effectively just be a list of all the buffers I've opened. Uh, SF, again, like I said, all the files in my project. Uh, SH lets me search the NeoVim help. So if I press leader SH, I can search all of the help documentation across all my plugins and across all of the uh, NeoVim and Vim. Super useful. Uh, SW does a grep on the current string. I wonder if that's project wide. This is the, the I think we want to get rid of this. Um, so the, yeah, this must be grepping across the project for SW. I think I want this to be controlled by Spectre, like we had above, wherever that was. Yeah. So rather than bringing up telescope for the current word underneath, Functions I would prefer it to open uh, Spectre for the current word. 
So let's go back up. Uh, can I get back to where we were? No, of course not. That'd be too convenient. So let's go back down to our telescope plugins. All right, we got through our diagnostics. We got through our quick fix. Got through all this. Oh, GX. I did skip this one. GX, if my cursor is over a link and I press GX, uh, it will load that link in um, the browser. So if we just have like github.com slash Mulroy and I do GX, it'll open that. So that's that plugin or keybind. We got through Harpoon. We got through Git. Uh, yeah, SG is searching by grep across the whole project. So if I press SG, I can then just search across everything in here and it'll grep uh, really the entire project for uh, whatever you type in. SD lets me search side diagnostics. I don't use this at all. And in fact, I override it right afterwards with uh, search git files, which we also have up above, so I can get rid of that. SC lets me search commands. I really don't use this because Wilder gives me autocomplete and fuzzy finding all my complaints, uh, commands down there. But if I did SC, this would also give me all my commands uh, in this view here. Uh, let's go delete that. Uh, leader slash is going to let me fuzzy search in the current buffer. Again, I don't really use this super frequently. Um, I just end up using the normal search down here. Um, so it's there though. Uh, leader SS lets me do a spell check. Uh, I uh, have tons of typos when I edit. So if I do SS, it's just gonna pop up spelling suggestions. And then here's our LSP keybinds. Um, so this is the function that if you recall in our LSP, we have map LSP keybinds in here. We import this function into our LSP keybinds uh, to use and we pass in the buffer. So if we go, excuse me, if we go back. So these are all of our LSP keybinds. So leader RN will rename the current symbol. Uh, so let's see if I can just do like this, that, just rename that and all of that in there. Um, yep, we wanna go there, sorry. CA is for opening code actions. So if I press leader CA, there's no code actions available. I don't know if I'm gonna get anything. I don't particularly know Lua's code actions, but that would give me code actions in other languages. Uh, pressing GD is my go to definition. Uh, GR is gonna be go to references. So if I do GR, it's gonna show me a list in telescope of all the references of that symbol. Uh, GI takes me to a list and telescope of implementations. Um, I don't think I've ever ran leader BS, uh, but that would give me all the symbols in the current buffer. Like instead, I would open up my uh, symbol map over here. Um, project symbols, again, like BS, I just don't really use this at all. Um, we map capital K to have that hover dock there and leader K for that. Um, control K when we're in an insert mode to get a uh, signature help. Um, we can go to declarations and then TD is for type definitions. Uh, we've already covered our symbol outline. Um, we've covered jumping uh, in illuminate. So illuminate again is what's hovering or highlighting uh, the same words. Um, I'm not even sure if this copilot yeah, so we have a copilot panel there. I never ever use copilot in that way. So we can close that. Okay, doesn't want to quit out of it. So can we close it that way? There we go. 
um, key binds for UFO. Uh, I map JJ. So if I'm in insert mode and typing, if I press JJ, I go out of insert mode. In visual mode, we disable space. Again, the same as normal mode, um, using capital L and um, capital L and H to jump to the beginning and end of lines. Uh, this is a super useful plugin. Um, so when I paste, we don't lose the contents of the register. Um, I have these. If I press Alt K or J, I can move selected text up or down. Uh, we've got some indentation stuff. So if I highlight a block of text and I press arrow arrow, moves it over and back. Or if we do equal, it just automatically does it. Uh, I never ever anymore use the terminal in NeoVim, but I have some key bindings for it. Um, yeah, so that's all my key binds. And then finally, the last stuff to cover is kind of all of my custom stuff. This group of uh, files here. So we'll start with highlight yank. So in here, uh, if I do like yanking word, if you see how it like highlights that whole block right there, that's what this plugin does. So, like when you yank something, uh, it highlights that whole block to give you like a visual indication that you yanked something. Next is gonna be format on save. And here, basically, this just runs that format command that we saw previously in my LSP file. Um, so when I write, it's automatically going to try to format the file. Uh, toggle ESLint. This basically just gives me a uh, user command that I can turn ESLint on and off with. Up next is the Rotate Windows plugin. Again, this is the plugin that uh, lets me do stuff like this. I just custom wrote it to the way I like it. It's one of my favorite things about NeoVim is being able to easily write this kind of functionality that fits your workflow. Um, and this was really easy to write. Like I just go look at the open windows. If I have more than two, I say I can't do it. Otherwise I just swap them. Next up is resize windows. So this is an auto command uh, that like, um, Basically, as I resize this, this just keeps the proportion of um, the windows or, or the, the open windows and buffer in your NeoVim buffers as it uh, resizes. Next is vertical help. Um, this just is a function that makes when I like, if I search for help, right? And let's say I just wanna go to, I don't know, look at LSP stuff, it's going to load it in a vertical tab rather than a horizontal tab. And that's just a personal preference. Next up is uh, this little edit text thing. And this just turns on word wrapping and spell checking when I'm in a text file, a git commit message, or a markdown file. And then toggle diagnostics is going to sound pretty exactly like it, what it is. If I, uh, I don't know, let's make some errors here. You can see that I have diagnostics showing up in my buffer. So if I run my toggle diagnostics command, it will just hide them and turn it off. And then I can come in and turn them back on. And I think that is pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Um, yeah, we got through everything. Uh, I will give a quick minute for chat here. Does anyone in chat have questions about my NeoVim config or NeoVim in general? The little Q and A sesh. Let me catch up on chat because I was not paying attention during any of that. Uh, thank you for the follows. Uh, everyone that followed during that, appreciate y'all. Give this another couple seconds for folks to ask questions. And again, you can find my dot files at uh, github.com slash dmmmulroy slash kickstart dot nix slash config slash envim. You go to that link. Uh, apparently we don't think we're in a actual URL. 
There we go. Oh, looks like I got that wrong. That's good to know. Why? Kickstart Nix config. Oh, it went to main. That's why. So this is going to be the actual URL. Again, that will be in the description. And bada bing, bada boom. All right, y'all. That's the full tour. Thank you very much. All right, let me add a marker for Kyle. Cool. So we'll get that uploaded to YouTube. Um, I am going to run to the bathroom quick and grab a coffee probably. I will be right back chat and we will jump back into Melange FFI stuff. Cool. Perfect. All right. Yeah, hopefully that was helpful, uh, Mohaid. Um, I am more than happy to help anyone with uh, NeoBim dot files. Like, feel free to just like DM me or jump into the Discord. Um, yeah, I love NeoBim. It's been a huge, huge um, improvement to my workflow. Um, and in fact, like I was having a ton of um, like wrist and forearm pain. Um, and switching to basically just having a keyboard only workflow, like within weeks, literally that pain went away. And that's actually not the reason I switched to NeoVim, NeoVim in the first place. I was using uh, VS Code up until 2022, the fall 2022. And I had originally started using uh, NeoVim movements in VS Code and had like a bunch of nice little shortcuts and everything kind of set up the way I liked, but I was like, you know, I don't want to take the time to write all this configuration. I like my NeoVim plugin or my VS Code plugins. And then um, at the time I was working in a giant TypeScript mono repo and man, TS server and VS Code just crawled like noticeable lag and lockups, constantly having to restart language servers. And that's what prompted me to switch to NeoVim and um, yeah, never looked back. All right, I will be right back chat. I have like talked my throat dry here. Functions describe the world. All right, we're back, chat. Let me... Yes, Vestag, Nix. I, I am enjoying Nix. I've been using it for a couple weeks now. Big fan so far. Pretty big learning curve, especially... Um, if you're not used to uh, like some functional programming stuff, but I really, I really like Nix. Same reason I switched Newvim and Moonlander, damn wrist pain. I am interested in trying out a split keyboard. Uh, Silvera, um, 
I don't have integration with OBS or Twitch yet for my music, which is maybe we'll do that tomorrow. Um, but we are listening to a single artist. Uh, we are listening to Noah Khan. Noah Khan is probably like my favorite artist I've found in the past year and a half. Yeah, that's like the one thing, like I love my keyboard. I don't have wrist pain. So like, is it really worth using a split keyboard? The one reason I want a split keyboard, I will say it's not wrist pain. It's the ability to have thumbs where I have more ergonomic keybinds for my NeoVim keybinds. <laughs> As Walrus Lord just said, the NeoVim to Moonlander keyboard pipeline is real. Yeah, I, I would want it for the additional symbols and keys by my thumb. So I might at some point try out a split, but uh, yeah, we'll see when we get there. All right, I'm gonna go check Twitter quick before we jump into the, the, the coding. All right, let's try to remember where we were at here. So with these split keyboards, like how many of them are hot swappable with any of them? Cause I would love to keep using my current switches. Like I really like glorious pandas. So we pushed, we published. We need to go upgrade this. So let's go ahead and do a bun update and we should get 21 probably. I guess we are on 20. Do we have changes to any of this? I can't remember. So we changed our branding to have voids. Oh, right, we were having that issue where using void was destroying this. Right, that was our problem. If we look at what, let's say we say uh, const x is going to be list dot of array. We'll do one, two, three. Our type system should infer this to be list of number, but it's not. It's inferring it to be a list of t, which is problematic to say the least. And I'm not sure if that's just our of function. Let's say we have declare uh, const list as a list number. It gets eaten to be list T. Like that's not what we want. So uh, let's solve this problem. I suspect, right, if we have like const LST is gonna be like, uh, We'll do the same thing over here. List dot of array one two three. Great. In fact, we can just do of array because we're in the file with that scope. We get a list t, and I don't think this is doing anything wrong. I wonder if this cast is part of the problem.
Are we losing our type information there? I'm betting so, right? This is gonna come out as, oh, that actually didn't do what I expected. <laughs> what up, extra sugar? Yeah, we do not do just basic HTML here. We do OCaml, we do ReasonML, we do some pretty in the weeds TypeScript stuff, like uh, at the type level. Um, a lot of functional programming content. Uh, yeah. So you've uh, you found yourself a good home here. Moonlander is hop swap. Okay, so Moonlander might be what I have to check out. Is there any uh, downsides or common complaints with the Moonlander? So I'm guessing if I come back in here and put the T back in, we're gonna get correct inference. Let's go ahead and restart our LSP server. We can close this over here. We already fixed that. So now we have a number. This is unfortunate because how could I demonstrate this problem here? Let's do a type to do, right? Uh, maybe the price, <laughs> other than the price, price aside, what are some uh, other common complaints with Moonlander? Uh, let's just say we have an ID. Yeah, great. That's the exact type we want and we'll just export it so this doesn't complain. Now let's say we make it to do in here. Um, of array and we'll make it to do, right? All right, not my best cup of coffee, but it's fine. I also spilled coffee everywhere. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. you. Appreciate you. Could you shut my door again, please? Yeah, hold on. I gotta clean your coffee. Okay. Sorry. Appreciate you. My com biggest complaint is too many keys and the bottom thumb key and top thumb key are hard to reach for me. Okay, that's good feedback. My main complete, says Pepper, is my Kiwi switches just don't sound the same because of the plastic enclosure. I need to try to add some foam in the enclosure to dampen the rattle. So when you say enclosure, what do you mean? Uh, Moonlander. <laughs> uh, that's mildly funny. The plastic, the plastic case the PCP is in. So like the axle switches themselves or the keys themselves. Do they sell? Are you talking? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused. I'm going to probably ask some dumb clarifying questions. Are you talking about the keycaps one and two? Do they sell um, custom keycaps for the vo or for this? And then PhD is saying that this key and this key on both sides are hard to reach. Trying to imagine what that would feel like. Coffee is great. I uh, I drink coffee from Black and White Coffee based out of Raleigh. I know I'm local to Raleigh, but it's worth. If I lived anywhere else, I would order from them anyways. It's so good. Y'all should try it. Yeah, the switches sit on top of the plastic case, so it's not as muted as a regular keyboard case. Yeah, so I would maybe try putting the plastic and foam or painter's tape and foam under this. Can you get into the underneath? I have friends as far as Memphis who swear by black and white. Rad choice, yeah. Black and white coffee is so good. Every single 
they have so many different flavors. Every flavor I've tried from them is just like amazing. And like there are, you can actually pick out the notes from their tasting guide. Sweet, yeah, maybe I'll pick up a uh, Moonlander. I'll treat myself for my birthday coming up in a couple days. Chat, I turned freaking 31 in uh, like a couple days here. Let's see. Next Friday, Groundhog's Day, I turned freaking 31. Sheesh. The big 3 0 Colchis. All right, so let me demonstrate our current type problem here. Hey, ARP coming your way. <laughs> Facts. So we should have a list of to dos here. Now, the problem I think that's going to occur is I'm going to be able to access, it's going to think I can access that, right? This is actually a list under the covers, but it's not, right? The way our brand type is set up, which we'll split over, go to brand, whoops, that's not what I wanted, in here. Because we have this T and brand, it's saying, yo dog, this type is a list or a to do and a list, but like that's not the case at all. Like this does not have title on it. Like that's not real. So this form of doing nominal types isn't going to fly. And I tried to get around that by using void, right? We came in here and we were like, void. But then this breaks inference somehow, and it's just saying it's a list of T rather than a list of unknown. So we can try another bottom type, like never. See what that gets us. A never, not useful at all. What about, I'm sure any's not gonna do us any justice. Yeah, no. Um, You just make it recursive. Yeah, that's not going to work. So this is a bummer because we're not going to be able to completely rely on nominal typing. Functions describe the world. 45 and six pots need to buy a plot soon. <laughs> Dude, you joke, but like there is like companies that make bank off selling graveyard plots like it's ridiculous but it's a thing maybe we go look at how some other functional Functions libraries in typescript are trying to handle the nominal typing problem that's like my I've ranted about like my people, people that have been following me for a long time know how I feel about TypeScript. I have a love-hate relationship. I've built my career off of it, but it's a really bad type system. Um, and just structural typing by default or as the entire type system coupled with gradual typing just makes for such a painful experience. Yeah, Walrus, 
uh, thank you for the follow, by the way. Super appreciate you hanging out. But um, I gave a conference talk recently. Um, actually, let me go through the slides rather than the talk itself. Um, where I showed an example of TypeScript's type system. So one of the points I really try to drive home in this, this uh, conference talk is that TypeScript is an unsound type system. Um, and like, what do I mean by unsound? Um, well, let's start here, right? So uh, we'll even just step through these slides. At the International Conference of Functional Programming, which I was lucky enough to attend this year, Anders Halsberg, who is the lead architect of TypeScript, uh, gave um, a conference talk on TypeScript's type system. And one of the quotes he said during that was, I mean, clearly, this type system is not sound, and it was never designed to be sound, and gradual type systems aren't. This should probably have an asterisk, because what Elixir is doing with their type system, if they execute with if the theory they have planned out works, they will have successfully implemented a gradual type system that is also sound, which is really, really interesting. So like if you're into like type systems and stuff, looking at what Elixir is doing uh, is super cool and interesting. Uh, so that's what Anders Halsberg said, right? So then he used this slide to describe the type system. He called it erasable gradual and erasable goes to your point walrus that it's uh, a linter right like all the types get erased at runtime gradual structural generic inferable which kind of i hate typescript's inference expressive object oriented functional and unsound so what does unsound actually mean a type a type system is considered sound if it guarantees that a program will not cause certain types of runtime errors, assuming that the program compiles and type checks successfully. So a type system is sound. If when we compile, everything's good, and that means we don't get runtime type errors at all. Like it would literally be impossible. So there are type systems like that that exist. TypeScript is not one of them. So what makes TypeScript unsound? Our usual culprits, right? Any type assertions using as, not null assertion, typed casts when we use uh, type guards or predicates or when we function overload. Um, surely, if we avoid these features in our code bases, we'll have type safe code. Unfortunately not. So here's an example where you can have TypeScript configured on the most strict settings and get no errors, but a runtime type error. So we have an account that's just a read-only username string um, has an admin flag on it. We have this function that validates a use, um, validates some username function, right? So we could pass different types into this because TypeScript is structural. So it's going to take some input that has a username on it. We're going to check if the username has a length of five. If not, we're just going to raise an error. And then we return the input back out to the caller. We have this nice little utility, uh, pretty printer. So basically given some record, we can print all the fields on it. And then you can think of this bottom code as like our application, right? We're going to create a new account. Username DM and Mulroy is admin true. We're going to validate it and then we're going to print it. This has a runtime type uh, error in it that TypeScript does not catch. Again, on the strictest settings of the TypeScript compiler, does anyone in chat, I'm sure some of you have already seen this slide or watched me give the talk, but can anyone call out where the type error in this code is? I'll give you a, a quick minute here. Again, no type errors in this code. Compile successfully, but it will blow up in your face at runtime. Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Boom, exactly. GG Matios got it. So this code lets us pass in uh, exact well, this is the line that causes the problem, which as uh, Matios calls it out, we're gonna end up having um, a Boolean passed in here. And even though we said this function accepts a record of string string, 
is actually operating on down here, a record of string or string unioned with Boolean. And it doesn't catch this. And this will like, this is super like innocent code, right? Like you could imagine like this print record code is like in some utilities file somewhere. Like all of us could make this mistake super, super easily. So that's basically what an unsound type, uh, type system is. And that's why uh, TypeScript leaves a lot to be desired. And I think if Elixir delivers on a sound gradual type system, um, I would hope that that would cause the TypeScript team to kind of consider their approach and maybe down the road have a um, uh, like maybe some opt-in features or a backwards breaking change on a major or something. So yeah, that's my rant on TypeScript. Uh, right, we want to go look at other functional programming libraries uh, and see how they handle nominal types. Um, let's see if FPTS does. Um, do we just have API reference? Yeah, let's see here. Let me blow this up for chat. We have a monoid, monad, N. Is an elixir full inference decidable? Um, I don't know what um, decidable means. They basically took the opposite approach of TypeScript on their inference where rather than bubbling up a bottom type, they will bubble up the inferred functions return type. Um, if that's what you mean, I'm not completely sure. There's a really, really good talk on it. Um, in fact, I'll just link this since I've been talking about it so much. Uh, Jose Val Valim? Uh, elixir types. Is this it? Seven months ago. Yeah, this is this is the talk right here. So this video basically covers the entire type system in like deep detail. So they have this concept of um, uh, what they call arrows, strong arrows. And I think that addresses what you're talking about. Let me drop this in chat quick. Cause this is like, even if you're not, I, I don't know Elixir, um, but like if you're into software engineering and like types and stuff in general, like I think you would have an appreciation for uh, this talk. There's a follow on video, uh, Elixir strong arrows is what they call them. Yeah, a new approach. To... Why would they delete that link? Let's see if we can find an answer here. For the type curious readers, set theoretic types implement a limited form of bounded quantification, a la kernel fun. In a nutshell, it means we can only compare functions if they have the same bounds. For example, our type system states a to A when A is an integer Boolean is not a subtype of A to A when A is an integer. We get lower bounds for free. Uh, enter gradual typing. Yeah, 
Yeah, they talk about dynamic as a type, and it basically like here they talk about like why TypeScript falls flat in this regard, and exactly what I just covered. And calling static code from dynamic code returns dynamic, which is what TypeScript does. Um, calling static code, or maybe this is what, oh, this is what TypeScript does, I'm sorry. Calling static code from dynamic code returns the static types with an additional runtime check, um, introducing strong arrows. I always said that um, Elixir, thanks to Erlang, is an assertive language. For example, if our identity function is restricted to only numbers, in practice, we would most likely write it as A to A when A is a number, and they use the guards. Um, we say Elixir is strongly typed because its function operators avoid implicit type conversion. The following functions also fail when their input does not match the type. So binary to binary, integer to integers, However, we can generalize this property so it's computed by the type system itself. To do so, we introduce a new concept called strong arrows, um, which relies on set theoretical types to derive this property. The idea goes as follows. A strong arrow is a function that can be statically proven that, when evaluated on values outside of its input types, i.e. its domain, it will error. For example, in our increment function, if we pass a string as an argument, it won't type check because string plus integer is not a valid operation. Thanks to set theoretic types, we can compute all values outside of the domain by computing the negation of a set. Given increment one, we'll fail for all types which are not number. The function is strong. By applying this rule to all type functions, we will know which functions are strong and which ones are not. If a function is strong, the type system will know that calling it with a dynamic type will always evaluate to its return type. Therefore, we say the return type of increment dynamic is number, which is sound and does not need further runtime checks. Going back to our debug function, when used with a guarded identity, it will be able to emit warnings at compile time, errors at runtime, warnings at compile time, errors at runtime without introducing any additional runtime check. A to A when A is a number, def identity arg when is blah, blah, blah. However, if identity function is not strong, then we must fall back to one of the strategies in the previous section. Another powerful property of strong arrows is that they are composable. Let's pick an example from the paper. Number, number to number, so subtract. In the above example, negate one's type is a strong arrow as it raises for any input outside of its domain. Subtract two is also a strong arrow because both plus and our own negate are strong errors too. This is an important capability as it limits how dynamic types spread throughout the system. I think this might be what you might be getting at here, Char, if I understand correctly. Arata, my presentation used type penetration to memory. Luckily, other graduated type languages can also leverage strong arrows. However, the more polymorphic a language and its functions are, the more unlikely it is to conclude that a given function is strong. For example, in other gradually typed language, such as Python or Ruby, the plus operator is extensible and polymorphic, and the user can define custom types where the operation is valid. In TypeScript, foobar plus one is also a valid oper operation, which expands the function domain. In both cases, an increment function restricted to numbers would not have a strong arrow type, as the operator won't fail for all types outside of number. Therefore, to remain sound, they must either restrict the operands with further runtime checks or return dynamic, which is how any's percolate through our code base. Yeah, so this is really cool. I'm really excited about this. Um, I think if Elixir pulls this off, um, yeah, it'd be a really impressive feat. Surely this has to have
Hmm. So it doesn't look like there's just a straight up nominal type in this library. Higher kinded type, invariant. Don't think this is what we want. Yeah, I don't think we're going to find probably what we want in here um, unless they specifically call out. Yeah, yep, exactly. I, uh, I talked about that in my conference talk too. It's like TypeScript. TypeScript has to be that way. One, because it's a strict superset of JavaScript and then inherently has to support all that dynamism and all the warts of JavaScript's runtime. And two, I don't think TypeScript would have became popular if it wasn't a strict uh, superset of JavaScript. So it's like you're damned, the TypeScript team was damned if they do, damned if they don't, because like clearly they understand type systems, clearly they understand that their type system is not sound. Um, and like TypeScript wouldn't have caught on if one, it wasn't able to be gradually typed and slowly introduced to code bases. And two, I really think TypeScript wouldn't have caught on if it wasn't for the definitely type repo um, and community contributions. And that only existed because it is a gradual type system. And yeah, so it's, it's a bunch of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bummer that so many devs it's simultaneously a super positive that so many devs have found value in static typing through TypeScript and also a bummer at the same time that uh, so many devs perspective of static typing is TypeScript because static typing can be so much better than TypeScript. Like just the amount of loopholes you have to jump through when you're making these super huge generic types using type mappers and um, uh, I can't even think of what it's called. The question mark operator, why can I not get it? Ternary expressions. I've implemented Hindley Milner Damas inference for JSON logic. That's awesome. That's, like my like a little side project I would love to do sometime is implementing uh, Henley Milner. Um, yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So part of like the reason why I stream and make some of the content I do is like, I had the light bulb moment about a year and a half ago when I started learning OCaml and ReasonML, where I was like, oh shit, like like type systems don't have to suck. And like, it was such an eye opening moment for me and just changed the way I thought about programming and problem solving that like, I, I want more TypeScript devs to have that, that experience. So that's a huge uh, part of the ethos behind my stream and my content. <laughs> All right, this is probably, let's see if we can just find nominal types TypeScript without just using the exact brand type I use. We can, we can maybe look at effect TS2, see how they're typing their like results and lists and stuff.
FFI is the foreign function interface. So with this package layer, I could load a C library into a Melange project. Not a C library, although uh, we use the same syntax in OCaml and ReasonML for FFI for JavaScript as we do C. Melange just, um, Melange's FFI layer lets us bind to JavaScript types and functions from OCaml code, even though that OCaml gets compiled to JavaScript too. It lets us write our applications in OCaml. Um, it, that FFI layer lets us safely call into TypeScript code we don't uh, control. Now, I think that, um, well, let me take a step back. In native OCaml and native ReasonML, we can use the same syntax or the same uh, FFI syntax and bind to C functions uh, instead. So if you're writing native, that's how it's going to feel super similar. Um, what Melange FFI is, this project I'm working on, is uh, building a library to basically flip the FFI model on its head. So rather than from Melange code binding directly to uh, like an NPM package or a third-party library, what you would do instead was you would write a tiny little FFI file and you would wrap the functionality from the node module you're looking for in this library. And the beauty of this library is it has all of Melange's or basically OCaml standard library, all of its types, all of its functions, currying, has all of that ported to JavaScript. So we effectively have all of OCaml's type system in JavaScript. So the idea is you would massage JavaScript types to be more OCaml-ish or ReasonML-ish before writing your external. So when you go to write your external, it's just super, super easy. You don't have to worry about all these attributes that are super confusing and worrying about the dynamism of JavaScript. You get to put this tiny little wrapper there that you control um, and turn it into OCaml types beforehand. And I also think we could potentially get it in such a way that you could generate the externals uh, that you have to write or the OCaml FFI side from these FFI files. So I've got a lot of ideas in this space. I've been largely inspired by Gleam and how they do FFIs, um, JavaScript FFI. Uh, Gleam has this JS prelude. Let me see if I actually contributed to this. Um, not Gleam, Gleam. Uh, this is going to be in the compiler core templates. Yeah. So if you look at the prelude, you can see that they basically do the same thing. So Gleam also compiles to JavaScript and I've taken a ton of inspiration from this. They have result types, all this. If you look at the actual implementation, um, they expose this little library to help make their um, their binding to JavaScript more Gleam-like before you write the actual externals. The worst thing that ever happened to JavaScript was Microsoft slash Yahoo voting no on ES4. If that never happened, we would have a real type system by now. So we got ActionScript 3, which was awesome and tied to a dying platform. I actually don't know this history. Classes eventually landed in Neo 6, but here's how it might have looked earlier. Class C. Yep, that looks pretty straightforward. That actually looks a lot like an OCaml module. The syntax here is pretty different, but another notable, but another notable that's missing word is that these classes have properties and constants. Yes, that's what I mean. I would love this, especially if I could give this a type too, bound to the, the class, or maybe it's implicit. 
The other thing is note this. Static on your private detected. ES4 introduced interfaces. Strict typing. Okay. Okay, that's nice. I like this feature a lot. Amazing. <laughs> oh my Lord. Dang, have you um, have you seen, I think it's Enzo. It's a type checker that's being worked on. Uh, I wanna go to my stars, where are my stars at? I just, someone shared this with me the other day and it basically, um, it's a JavaScript compiler and TypeScript checker, which uh, essentially brings somewhat close to Hindley Milner type checking to the language. It's really, really cool. Um, dependent typing, really nice error messages. Like, look at this, like, tell me that's not amazing. Yeah, so, Right now it's a, a very early project, but I think it's pretty promising. Cause like if we could drop in something over top of TypeScript like this, like, man, that would, that would be close to what we want or what I want. All right, let's keep, I'm getting super distracted. Wait, how did we get to this page? What is this? Type T value, ID foo, foo ID. Mm, I don't think this buys us what we want here. I'll have to take a look at flow again. If that's true, then it's a bummer that TypeScript beat out flow. <laughs> I know that Melange under the cover uses a bunch of flows uh, type checking. I wonder if we could abuse enums here. I know they generally introduce runtime overhead, but maybe it's a worthwhile price. So the two options we have right now is either find a good way of representing, uh, of using nominal types in TypeScript and hiding the underlying melange runtime representation of our uh, types and data structures, or we write types for Melange's runtime stuff and introduce those into our FFI layer. 
which I'm not sure which I want to do. Where was that nominal types? You were just there. Foo and D brand. So I'm curious what that ends up looking like. Let's say um, I guess it wouldn't be that, right? It'd be enum list. Oh, right, 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 that's not the problem. It's this, it's the name. Okay. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. So then let's see how our inference works here. What's this end up being? Still list of T, son of a bitch. And I'm assuming enums can't be generic. Can TypeScript enums be generic? Uh, 
Uh, let's go ahead and like close everything to the left. Of course. Annoying. Excuse me. Okay, so this is a pretty recent update here. T enum extends enum. Enum fruits, colors, sure. Type enum value has a generic type enum, key of t enum, and a number in string. I don't know if that's super useful. Cause like, what does this buy us? Anything? I don't think this buys us much of anything here. Just say this is a list. What does that give us? It thinks it's a it thinks it's a number? So we have this t enum extends an enum object. Hey, it'd be nice if our enums could take generics. <laughs> This isn't what we want here. Blah, 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 blah. Nothing useful. Heterogeneous enums. <laughs> yeah, not being able to give a type parameter to an enum is kind of a non-starter for this. But can we do dot list? Const enum is going to be used in property or index access. Uh, 
And let's just make sure our uh, language server is playing nice. <clears throat> and just for extra shits and giggles. Might be getting closer. I don't know why it still thinks it's a number. <laughs> it's so weird. Like, that's weird. Maybe that's the solution here. Because that looks like we just got the inference we wanted. Rather than using a symbol as the brand. Now it's inferring as a list of to-dos. We can't get anything. Okay, that actually just solved our problem. We don't even have to do anything fancy. Am I missing anything obvious with this solution? Okay, we get the inference there. I think this seems reasonable. So we're saying we can't get to this brand, so it doesn't matter. We couldn't index into this key even if we wanted to. Okay, I think this is actually close to what we want. In fact, we could like say nominal.ts, write that. All right. We've got some inspiration here. Um, brand, and we could say import uh, brand from brand, and then we export type nominal. We'll take a T and we'll do brand and this will actually be void, and this will be t, right? Um, let's get ChatGPT to write some type docs for us. Given these type docs, uh, type slash js docs, Please write one in a similar style for what up, roasted? 
Good evening. If this works, I'm going to be super, super stoked that we just cracked a nominal typing. I don't think we need you. Yeah, we don't need that. Wow, is Leandro really working? I, th I think so. I think he might be uh, actually buckling down and doing some stuff. I mean, even though he's like, even on stream, he's probably the most productive person I've ever watched stream in my entire life. Leandro is one of those special people who is genuinely a 10X engineer. Uh, let's see here. 20X dev, for real, Ryan. Ryan, if you just showed up, you missed me. We went over uh, Elixir's set theoretic types and strong arrows on stream earlier. <laughs> Proud of you, Roasted. I had lurking was doing dad things, understandable. All right, so we've got this terminal. Nominal, nominal, represents a nominal based on the concept. Texture, touches. Annoying theme question, why the cursive font for comments? Um, so I recently switched fonts to Mono Lisa because um, I was having some rendering issues with the font that I've been using for almost a decade. I was using Dank Mono and um, Dank Mono also has cursives for italics. And I've just grown to really, really like that and grown to really accustomed to uh, reading code in that way. And uh, yeah, I just, it's just my preference, I suppose. This, um, I could change it if I want. Like right, right now they have like this F, which is the way I have it. I can change it to look like that, but I, I still, I don't know, I like the cursive. I love also that Mona Lisa uses reason as a syntax variant. Like I love this, right? Like this syntax here. Like if I make a reason file Jump into here. I don't get that let. I wonder why I'm not getting that cursive L. Because I want the cursive L. 
and I want the cursed type. It's probably my syntax highlighter. I have like custom shit for for um, reason. Uh, yeah, so Dank Motto is actually made by one of my former coworkers at Formidable, Phil. Also a literal 10x developer, 20x. Um, operator Mono is super expensive and then I don't think it has ligatures. That should probably get taken down. Yeah, see, like, this has cursives, too. Um, operator mono just doesn't... I would have paid for oper operator mono, but it doesn't have ligatures. And I love ligatures. And it's super expensive. Like, that's more expensive than... I think Mona Lisa is, like, 80 bucks or something. I probably still would have paid for it if it had ligatures though. Yeah, no, I have a, I wish they had ligatures. Cause there are some bits of Mona Lisa that I don't love, but, um, YOLO. Nominal type T uses void as its base and brands it with a unique type T. This results in a type that's considered different from void or any other types branded differently, even though it structurally resembles void. Sure. All right, so now we should be able to go into list, right? And everywhere brands at in here, we should be able to come down here and be like, uh, nominal T. Like that looks good. So let's go try doing a publishing a release of this using um, this type here. So we can get rid of you and this will become nominal T. <laughs> That's a typo, it's so bad. My worry is though, technically, if I have a, um, let's say this is a, Clear const sum is a sum of number, or let's make a uh, number will be fine to test the theory. And then we have a declare const uh, list, number list.
My worry is this is going to be structurally equivalent. Some number, excuse me. And this will be list. Of number and I'm afraid is my new emoji pair well done Ryan well done I didn't even know we could have emojis I'm afraid that I'm gonna be able to assign my um, sum number to this. Yep, no type problem. Shit, we almost got there. We can probably introduce an extra level of branding. Let me think about this. I have to go take a leak, I will be right back. You were just zen out over here. Just make yourself comfortable, huh? You're just making yourself comfortable. You good girl. You good girl. All right. Let's see here. So we want to make this state impossible. And right now it's not, which is not good. So let's jump over to nominal. I have an idea. Let's a uh, yoink. Well, hold on. What if we updated our brand type to be something like rather T and that. Let's say it's gonna be that and we'll put like um, type T. Something like this. And then rather than
All right, let's see if we can get this working. Um, let's go back to our list and let's undo. And our nominal, we need to get our, yeah, that back. So this now takes our T and this will take a brand of type of list. Now does this, that, that looks good. Mmm, shit. Okay, immediately got a type error. That's good. All right, we don't have anything on there. And let's make sure that's inferred correctly. That looks good. Okay, that, so far this feels good. This feels like it might be doing what we want. We have to go test our option. And instead in here we say, this will be um, nominal. Yeah. Okay, that looks good. Get rid of you. And then the last thing we need to check is in our test file. Type some number is not assignable to type list number. Let's fucking go. Let's go chat. I think that works. I think that's like literally what we want.
I'm using Ghosty. Great, that sounds much better. Um, not particularly. It's been a pretty seamless transition. Especially that Neovim. Neovim just worked perfectly. What the fuck just happened there? Okay, that looks good. So I think we might have cracked this code here. Okay, that looks good. Um, I mean, performance-wise, someone somehow Kitty just starts to jitter every time of a large file and type or any of them. <clears throat> yeah, I haven't noticed anything like that. It's been incredible. Okay, so we do have some type checking problems, which is okay. Uh, that seems like a mismatch. All right, so in here, it says argument of type unknown. Dude, there must have been an update to fast check that made anything come through as unknowns. This is gonna be the problem every spot.
Okay, cool. That looks good. Oh, coffee's kicked. <clears throat> All right, let's run our tests and um, then publish a new version as long as we're good here. Lovely, that looks good. Um, add nominal type plus, uh, I think we fixed reduce. Can't remember if that was in here, whatever. And we'll say bun publish run run publish patch. Great, our types got published correctly. We probably wanna check them just in case. That was, damn it, I just doxed my fucking NPM password. Fuck. I was moving too quickly. Good thing is I have 2FA on, but regardless, I should probably roll my password now. Mm -hmm. All right, we're updated. None of you clowns can hack me. <laughs> After this song, we're gonna switch it up a little bit. All right, so we just published that. Let's jump over to S tier and let's upgrade our version of S tier. Uh, so we should be able to open this and say bun update. <laughs> Facts. That was like, I have very few um, passwords that are unmanaged anymore. But uh, like back when I was in like high school, that was a, a go-to. I use Bitwarden for like everything nowadays. Anything important is on Bitwarden. I did say we got version 21, right? Yeah, let's just get TS server to a clean state. And we should also update our brand type here. Because rather than this, we should do the same thing, right? Do we have type brand? And that's gonna be, um, that. And then how did we do this in our list? We had this nominal type, right? Maybe we export nominal from our library and let other people make nominal types. Just copy for now.
Okay, let's see how that works out. If we come down here. Uh, let's clear a terminal. Let's do a, uh, I think I have cat package JSON. Build OCaml build. Yeah, let's just do a do, uh, bun run build. That looks good. Also, I want to jump back and look at the type definition that this generated. Okay, that looks good. Let's look at what we generated over here. So it's gonna be in dist index.d.ts. We only export our canonical struct, our type. Did we actually do that right? Let's just say we have a S expression. That looks good. Okay. Okay, I think that I think that covers it. I think that's exactly how we want this nominal type system to work. Cool. Uh, import last thing I want to check is import star as s tier from. Uh, dot, I guess. And what do we have available in this thing? Perfect. We don't expose any of the shit we don't want. Sweetness. All tree shaking for us. Jesus. That's so much. Delete that. 
and then we can bump and publish a new version of S tier. And then we want to write a uh, test for S tier. And then we're going to try to introduce like a pipe slash chaining mechanism to Melange FFI. And then I think we're like pretty close to publishing Melange FFI version one. Like we're pretty damn close. So let's publish this. Um, jump down here, clear that, get status, what we got? Cool. And let's do a npm run publish patch. All right, git add, um, git commit, um, bump launch FFI. And then we do a bun run publish patch. Just gonna keep npm on the other screen this time so I don't dox my new password. Great. Okay, so S tier 21 is published. And the last thing we need to test or check really is that um, all of this still works real quick. Um, bun update, we should get new versions of Melange FFI and bun. They're both on version 21 coincidentally. So what's this error type is? We get an S tier S expression. That's what I would expect. It should be a string. It's funny that that constant it. This should be a result. Ooh. That's not correct. That's not correct. Did we update? We didn't update the rest of Melange FFI to use this nominal type system, did we? I don't think we did. Brand, yeah, we did not. So we're gonna say this is gonna be changing word nominal carry through our T type of we shouldn't need brand anywhere. Okay, uh, let's go do the same to option. Looks like we did do that. Okay. I don't think we have any other types in here that have branding. Uh, yeah, Justine. I will be right out. All right, let's get through, uh, let's publish this again. I'm gonna go eat. And while I'm eating chat, I'm just gonna throw on that conference talk on um, Elixir's uh, it's new type system, uh, just as something interesting to watch while I eat, but then we'll be back. Um, might come back with a glass of whiskey. Do, uh, you know, up the Balmer's Peak a little bit. Let's go through and make sure everything is cleaned up and good here. That's good. That's good. And finally, you're good. Let's do a type check. Everything's great. Great. Okay, let's publish everything again. Um, use nominal types for results. <laughs> Justine, look at chat.
Ryan, I give you full permission to take Justine on a, uh, a nice dinner date. She has expensive taste. Okay, that one's published. Let's go upgrade S tier. Um, bun update. We should get the new version there. There we go. And uh, bump launch at the five. And then we do a bun run publish patch. Great. Same deal over here, publish. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate that. <laughs> no, you take her. Hey, Justine, Ryan Winchester just paid for our next date night. Okay, uh, da, 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 da. so we publish that, do a git push, and then let's go see if that actually worked. I really hope it did. Uh, let's just right quit out of here. Let's give TypeScript every opportunity to do the right thing. Vim. I'm so scared. Chat, I'm so scared. I'm afraid to hover dock this. Let's go. Let's fucking go. First try. First fucking try. Hell yeah. And let's actually just run it quick. Bun index. There was an error parsing. That's okay. We did parse the first one okay. So we'll come back and work on that after I get done eating. Let's go watch and learn about set theoretic types in Elixir. Uh, Elixir types. Da, 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 da. Seven months ago, this one. We'll pause you. How's the volume, chat? <laughs> Granny. <laughs> Okay, well, now that everyone's awake, uh, lurkers, I apologize for the violent outburst of dogs. They thought that the timer on the stove was the doorbell and hence the apocalypse was starting. Um, but I'm going to full screen this and uh, yeah, I'm gonna go eat probably for 10 or 15 minutes with Justine and uh, enjoy this talk. It's really, really good. I'll put it on like 1.25, so. Volume's still good? Yep, okay, cool. I will be back here shortly, y'all.
and we're back. What did everyone think of the video? There's still 34 people hanging around. Did I get my glasses on here? Oh God, why is this so difficult? Okay, coffee mug doesn't need to be here. Set that over here. And then I uh, don't think my alcohol is on stream. Here we go, chat. Just... Oh, tell me that's not a glorious sound. We are having the finest monkey shoulder scotch whiskey in the world. And actually we're gonna Oh, that's a steep pour. Whatever, we're kicking the bottle. I'm drinking cheap wine from Boston Pizza Delivery. I didn't even know you could have wine delivered. Look at this fucking pour. We're gonna be really experimenting with Balmer's Peak here in a bit. <clears throat> Let me get the music started. Let's turn the vibes up. Yes, sir. This is Canada, land of the free. That's that's a you know, Justine. We're moving to Canada. Oh, I guess she can hear me. She's listening to the stream. Uh, let's go to radio, and we're gonna click my radio. Oh, sure. We'll go with Wonder Years. Okay. So let's debug this failing uh, deserialization. Mm. So good. Okay, so we want to effectively jump into, okay, we already have this. So we're failing on canonical deserialize. I wonder if we just do something like this and make it simpler if we fail, even in simpler cases. Um, so let's delete that. Try something like this, bun index.ts. Yeah, yeah, so we are definitely, oh, because we're trying to deserialize a, um, that's not a canonical expression, right. I mean, idiot chat. This would just be deserialize. That looks like it worked. Beautiful. Okay, that's what we would expect. So let's uh, serialize it then to a canonical expression and re-serialize um, it. Um, let's see what that gives us. 
Okay, that looks great. And then we want to take this, right? And we want to try to um, We want to try to uh, deserialize it, right? Uh, const cs expression equals do string, and then let's say console dot log. Um, con yeah. Great, that worked. I think. Did that work? Are these equivalent? Hello, if we home. Some blink, let's go. All right, so theoretically, oh, it's a result, right, 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 right. That's probably why it looked weird in the log. So we want to do um, result.unwrap. And we should be able to do that, right? Bring that in. That should give us a canonical S expression. Okay, let's, boom. That looks good, and now let's make sure they're equal, and then we'll go write uh, some property tests for S tier, and then try to copy Tech Savvy Travis uh, piping library to our Melange FFI library. Well, not copy it, but take a lot of inspiration from his stuff. What up, Owen? How are you doing? Uh, so let's say um, const equal is um, s tier dot canonical dot serialized. Yeah. So I would expect this to be equal. I'm doing pretty well, pretty well. Cool, okay, everything is working. Our, yeah, great, 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 great. So now, let's go pull up our .dts and we're gonna uh, get ChatGPT to write some tests for us. And let's jump over to Probably just want to put it here. S tier dot test dot ts. Okay, and then let's pull up chat jippity. Don't only did I close that window? I did. Uh, where's our test? Here we go. Just working on some PHP stuff for a few client sites. Nice. I watched Aaron's, Aaron Francis's video on modern PHP recently and damn, 
PHP is genuinely looks nicer to use than TypeScript and JavaScript. Okay, now we're going PHP has been greater than JS for a long time since v7 really. Yeah, it's wow, really cool. But now you have frameworks like Laravel, which use inertia JS. Cool. I'll have to check out that. Okay. Let's go ahead and jump here and um, we're going to say right fast check. Um, here is the .d.ts file for S tier. I want you to initially write fast check test for atom and list. Hi, Alice. How are you doing? This lovely, I guess it's probably pretty late where you're at or starting to get late. Almost midnight. Are you, are you a night owl person? This isn't quite right. All right, we might just write this ourselves. Functions describe. I watched Glitch's stream until 3 a.m. yesterday. Yo, how awesome was it watching Leandro sing? Who knew the man had pipes? Oh yeah, Ryan, you missed out hardcore. Leandro freaking sang and broke out his guitar and like, it was really, really good. Like not just like, you know, good, like actually really good. All right. These are not what I want to do. I'm just going to write these tests by hand. So we're going to say describe. I guess we need to install our dependencies first. Um, bun install lol. I used fastest Levenstein distance for an interview the other day. Um, and then we, we can we can crib a lot off of our Melange FFI test. So let's just go grab 
this and that. Hey, Dill, contractor's coming in about 20 minutes to get some final measurements. Does that mean we're gonna have to move the desk out? Oh, that's gonna be annoying. Justine, can you ask him if um, he'll need me to move the desk? Should I need to move the desk? Okay. Do we not have bun types installed? Yeah, so in about 20 minutes chat, I'm gonna probably uh, throw on something for y'all to watch again for maybe 10 minutes um, while I step away and let our contractor come take some last measurements in my office here and uh, I'll be back. Um, we do have bun types installed. Oh, maybe not in this library though. De no, we definitely have bun types installed. So why doesn't that like importing from bun test? Uh, I bet it's probably our TS config types, bun types. Bun types. I hate TypeScript and JavaScript tooling. Like once you get it set up, it's great, but then uh, getting it set up is a pain in the ass. Pain in the ass. Uh, dot slash source. Yeah, let's just do that. Dot ts, and then we'll do another entry that's uh, change left mjs. I don't think I have any MJSs, do I? No, I don't. So it's just going to be TS. I also don't think that's right. Okay, let's, I don't know why it's not picking up bun types. That's very confusing to me. Uh, here. Okay, now it's working. So one of those import or include statements uh, must have Fix it up just fine.
Oh man, we got some alkaline trio. A freaking bop. Um, okay, so we have that. Uh, let's actually make this full screen. Do a B split. Go into here. I actually want to go to here. No, not there either. Build, default, source. Nope, disk, source. Yeah. Let's see if we can get ChatGPT to write, write a test for this. Write fast check test for this. You can, you, for the following code, you can compare an atom to an expected value by calling, maybe we start with the deserialization stuff so we teach ChatGPT how to deserialize and serialize. <clears throat> Rather than using serialize to check a quality, <laughs> how do we actually want to test this? I don't think the song is too heavy. Sorry, I'm updating the volume here. This song's like randomly louder than the others. Okay. Let's see here. Hey, 
Yo, what's up? Where's Winnie? In my office. Oh, okay. Can you send her up here so I can get her in? Winnie, go. Go get Justine. Go get her. Go get her. Go upstairs. Come on. Let's go upstairs. Go girl. Good girl. Go girl. No, 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 no. Upstairs. Go. Up. Up. Over what? All right, so does this have, we should probably just go to the ocaml.org docs and see if there's a comparison. SXPLib docs. Let me turn on dark reader. Sorry, chat. Compare. So it does have a compare. So we should, we should implement compare and equal. So let's add that to our library because that's gonna make testing easier. So in here, let's go ahead and eval our opamm, good doom build, great. Whoops, it's not what we wanted. All right, so we want a compare. I don't know how you would compare it to. What makes, what makes one S expression greater than the other? Just the number of atoms? Thank you for the subscription, Diva. Super appreciate you. Yeah, potentially. You're probably right. I wish it had some freaking better docs. But alas, we do not. Wait, why did that say it's a read only? Weird. Whatever. Let equal will be a b, and then we'll say s expression dot equal a b. Okay. We're not gonna play nice here. <laughs> that's awesome, Diva. That's I. That's the first anyone has said they found my YouTube videos and watched through them. I super super appreciate you watching them and subscribing and coming and hanging out. Um, yeah, how has your experience been learning OCaml so far? So we probably have to re-export from here. Include S expression. Just S expression, right? I might have to grab another file here. Yeah, I'm going to have to. So let's go grab um, that from Jane Street. Crazy change of paradigm, loving it. What's your background in? Uh, Include pre. Physicist working as background engineer for 18 years. Nice. What um? What's your background in programming languages? Type with layout. Where 
is the comparison stuff. Python mostly, about six years using TypeScript and C++. Nice. Well, I'm glad you're loving OCaml. I, uh, I started learning OCaml about a year and a half ago with my background being almost exclusively TypeScript. And like, it's such a change and a welcome change at that. Module type, do we implement this module then? Am I in MLI? No, I'm not. This is all signatures. We could do like a really naive comparison where we serialize to a string and just do like um, a string equality check. Do I think functional is better than OOP? Yeah, I definitely think functional is better than OOP. I think what OOP is, is a abomination of what Alan Kay initially uh, intended it to be. <laughs> Compare equal. Interface specification for handling S expressions. So where's the f probably functor that spits this out? It's actually funny when people say that since Alan Kay's idea of OP are kind of the opposite of what I like about it. What do you mean by that, Alice? Like you, like what OP does well is data abstraction and small talk is not, oh, gotcha. Where the hell does this Lexer, it's not gonna be, I don't think it would be the Lexer. I'm going to end up having to copy this entire repo. And in that case, there's probably system dependencies. All right, y'all, contractors here. I got to go take care of this for a bit.
Okay, we're back. <laughs> I have a take on that version of OP. I think I even talked about it earlier today or yesterday. Is that uh, world. I think more money has been lost due to the Gang of Four book and Clean Code than like anything else in our industry. Oh boy. <laughs> And we get a raid from the Alt F4. What up, BG? Welcome, Raiders. Functions describe. What'd you say, Justine? Are you not going to get I will when you ask me to. Hey, Alright, one second. I just got raided. Raiders, I will be right back. I gotta let the dogs down from upstairs. Give me 30 seconds. Okay. And we're back. So everyone that came from BG's raid, uh, <laughs> we are writing TypeScript. Uh, actually, we're getting ready to write just a little bit of OCaml, but today is mostly, mostly a, a TypeScript day. All right. Listen, we're writing TypeScript so we don't have to write TypeScript. It's a, you know, it's the price we pay. I want to see how... How's the volume chat? I can't tell how the music level is. I want to see how they implemented equality checks. Not in this file. Maybe in this file? No. Oh, Lord. Thank you for the gifted subs, Diva. Super appreciate you. I mean, I can show you what we're working on explicitly. A um, little loud, but just the song. All right, let's try another song then. Try to keep it. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, okay, cool, sweet. Uh, let's bump that over, that can close. I need to find where the hell equal is implemented. Let equal, val equal. Oh, is it getting generated via a PPX somewhere? I bet it is. All right, we'll just implement our own equal for now so I don't have to fight porting this over. So let's uh, go in here and say, um, do we want to implement this? Yeah, we want to implement this in TypeScript. So here's the TypeScript, Joy. There you go. All your lovely goodness. Got a little recursion going on. So let's say in after these, did you have a chance to watch my conference talk yet, Joy?
I have a, uh... <laughs> I'm tempted to go through this. I already did it on stream earlier today, but I'm tempted to go through the TypeScript point in my presentation with you while you're here. Let me write this and I'll show you, uh, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So let's say uh, return, um, we'll say serialize A equals serialize B. Those should turn into strings. Yeah. And this will be a function It does, it does. It's just like, listen, I worked in TypeScript for, and JavaScript professionally for a decade. And I haven't gotten into functional programming and starting to dip my toes into other type systems until about a year and a half ago. And when I experienced what type systems, what good type systems can actually be, it's just like this light bulb moment. It's like doing stuff like, um, this, like this garbage is not necessary, like at all. Like this is not what a good type system needs to be like. You don't need to fight it like this. Like I'll show you in a, a quick minute here, an example of where TypeScript falls flat on its face. Do we want to curry this function? Sure, but OCaml's curried by default though. And like, okay, maybe that's a bad example, Alice, but like you, like if I pulled up, uh, or F -band. Like look at some of these types that I've had to write. Uh, if we look at this guy right here, temporal response, like all of this insane mapping and it just gets worse and worse the deeper you go. Uh, where's an even better example? Um, that's not even the worst of it. Is it in here? Yeah, check this out. This is an abomination. Look at this. So this is fetching against one of our data APIs and like the structure of a temporal request is just gonna be, we can go look at this, right? So a temporal request is going to have, it can be a union of all of these different types, all these different queries, but at a high level, it's gonna have a chain a market, a submarket, an action, and some query. Like what all of those things mean isn't super important, but we can map a specific response type from a request given on the type. And because TypeScript cannot narrow generic functions return type to a single member of a discriminated union by generic type argument, we must use casting slash assertions via the as keyword. The we do this in a type safe way for each member of the union with an assertion using assert true and equals types. This asserts that the narrowed type response promise is equivalent to a member of the discriminated union and gives us the confidence that we can cast via as to the wider return type. An example of this, which you'll see the whole way throughout this function, is we have, we basically do inline tests via like this assert true and equals types. So we can switch on our request time and then narrow it down. And like this function takes a specific thing or it returns a range response. And then we do this assertion 
like, hey, does this meet our uh, expectations? Excuse me, you do what? Yeah, so uh, this is some lovely TypeScript that uh, I got to write for work. S super complicated, way more complicated than it needs to be. Like it's just, Madness is what this is. It just gets, it's, it's, it's painful. It's painful. Is that normal though for a single endpoint to bring back different response signatures? Why not? It's all the same object. It's a the endpoint is controlling a temporal response, which gets treated uh, under the covers. It's not a TypeScript problem because we have clients in other languages that don't other statically typed languages that don't have this problem. Um, it's a TypeScript. It's hard to express types like that in TypeScript because of TypeScript's, it's a gradual type system with unsoundness. Dude, I wanna learn a new language this year and could explain for what stuff OCaml is good for. OCaml is a general purpose language. It's super fast. Um, it I, You can make CLIs with it. You can make web servers with it. You can write front end web apps with it and compile it to JavaScript. It's really, really good for compilers, as well type which said. Um, I use OBS, uh, Life by You. All right, so now we need to write a type definition for this. Yeah, I'm I'm really I'm really interested in um, what do you think about Elixir? Might try it uh, one day after trying other things. Uh, I think Elixir is super cool. I think what they're doing with set theoretic types and potentially building a sound type system, uh, a sound gradually type type system is really interesting. Um, that being said, one of the people uh, in the OCaml community is building a framework called OTP, or Jesus, is building a framework called Riot, which is based on Erlang's and Elixir's OTP framework. So we should get all the benefits of uh, Erlang and Elixir in OCaml. All right, uh, Joy, give me one minute to write the JS docs for this and the type definition. In fact, I don't think we need to curry this. That's not important. Let's get rid of this curry. We'll do that. Uh, And then we can go ahead and say, do that. And then we can say, this is going to return a Boolean. Yeah, I think 
Um, I obviously <laughs> I am not a type theorist or an expert. I am just starting to learn about all of these things, but I think um, I think well type witch's point about uh, having mixed feelings about strong arrows and how it's going to stack up in um, like polymorphic contexts is a good call out. Um, they're even they're. The, at the end of that video that I played on stream while I was eating dinner, they're specifically hiring a postdoc for research on strong arrows with polymorphism and stuff. So it seems like that's an area that they're not 100% on yet either. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Angel. And also, uh, I don't know if this is working again yet. Let me see. Yeah, my bot is just borked right now. So nobody redeem that. We'll reset that. Uh, I have glorious panda switches. <laughs> Come on, there it goes. Why can't I accept that? Oh God, I forgot my co-pilot mapping. There we go. Mm -hmm. And then at returns, take that, close that up. What did I do wrong here with my... We're in a TS file. Oh, is there a space there? There's not. Oh, this needs to be, there we go. And then we can yank that block, throw that down here. And this will be canonical. All right. All right, Joy, let me, uh, let me go uh, show you this bit. I'm gonna give you a test here. Second time we're pulling this up on stream today, but YOLO. Thank you for the, the cheer. So, um, what would be important to show or where to start? Let's just start at the, the TypeScript section, right? So let's talk about TypeScript. TypeScript is a statically typed uh, programming language. It has excellent tooling, uh, even though some of it is painful. Once it's configured, the developer experience is actually pretty good um, and the quality of the tooling is actually pretty good compared to uh, languages. TypeScript can be gradually adopted. Uh, a huge reason for its uh, success, right? Like back in 2016, 2017, when we were all writing uh, JavaScript applications without types, um, the definitely type repo popped up, which was, which is or remains um, to be a community repo where everyone contributes types. And the fact that we could slowly add types to our code bases, I think really helped bolster the adoption. Um, TypeScript enables a better developer experience. Think about like our, even though TS server can be kind of finicky, we have really good uh, auto-completes, refactoring capabilities, go to do it, definition, things of that nature. And overall, TypeScript is a vast improvement over JavaScript. That being said, and here comes your but TypeScript can be cumbersome and complex using things like type mappers and getting too far in the weeds with uh, generics and um, you know all that stuff. It, it trying to represent types can be complicated because TypeScript is a strict superset of JavaScript and has to be able to represent the dynamism 
and all the runtime works of JavaScript. Which is exactly what I just said. <laughs> TypeScript has too many, too many escape hatches and it can create a false sense of safety. And ultimately TypeScript is unsound. I might have to go take care of the dogs real quick, but Winnie, knock it off. She gets one more chance. Winnie Marie, ma'am, what are you barking at? Stop it, I'm in my office, come on. Here's your couch, come on. Up, come on, up, up. Good girl, lay down. Good girl. <clears throat> okay, so ultimately TypeScript is unsound. And don't just take my word for that. At the International Conference of Functional Programming this year, Anders Hausberg, who is a Microsoft fellow and the lead architect of TypeScript, said in his keynote, I mean, clearly, this type system is not sound and it was never designed to be sound and gradual type systems aren't. They may be sound in islands, but they're not overall sound. He used this slide to describe um, TypeScript's type system it's erasable, gradual, structural, generic, inferable, expressive, object-oriented, functional, and unsound. Okay, but what does unsound actually mean and why should you care? A type system is considered sound if it guarantees that a program will not cause certain types of runtime errors, assuming that the program type checks and compiles successfully. So what makes TypeScript unsound? Well, we have our usual culprits, any, type assertions using the as keyword, non-null assertions, and typecasts via type guards or predicates and function overloads. Surely then, if we avoid those, we'll have sound and type safe code. Unfortunately, not. So let's take a uh, look at an example of uh, how TypeScript can be unsound. So. Let's say we have just a simple little app that lets us create accounts for users. Our users can be admins, right? So we have type account as a username and a flag to determine whether they're an admin or not. We have a function called validate username, which takes some input that has a username on it. We check the length of the username, make sure it's five. This is just arbitrary. We throw an error if it's too short, and then we return the input back out to the caller. Then you can imagine we might have this little utility method called print record, which essentially is just going to uh, pretty print our, uh, uh, you know, some record. So this bottom part down here, you can imagine is our app, right? We create a new account. Username is DM Mulroy. Is admin is true. We pass it to our validate username. This is longer than five characters and we're not going to get an error. And then we go to print it. This code successfully type checks and compiles, but there's still a runtime type error. And this uh, compiles and type checks on the strictest settings of the TypeScript uh, compiler settings. So Joy, riddle me this, can you pick out where the runtime type error is in this code um, despite completely type checking and compiling successfully? And like this code, the if statement? No, it is not the if statement. That is not a type error. That's a genuine error. That is not where we get an error. Like this is totally reasonable code, code that we probably all have very similar stuff in our code bases, right? No, 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 there is not the error we throw, there is a type error, a runtime type error that occurs in this. Yep, I got you, I'll keep it, I'll keep it on the slide for a minute. Now, like I said, totally normal innocent code that we could all, we've all seen in our code bases.
It is the dot trim, exactly. So TypeScript is gonna let us call dot trim on a Boolean, right? So our print record is annotated to take a record of string string, but our type account is really a record of string or string union with Boolean. So when we get here, our application is going to crash at runtime unless we have a try catch somewhere. Does it turn into an any? No, it does not turn into an any. And then, you know, disclaimer, I do love TypeScript, despite my critiques and criticisms of it. It has introduced a whole generation of developers to the merits and benefits of static typing and type safety. The TypeScript team is one of the most impressive teams in open source. It has generally improved the quality of our applications code and experiences for our users. Um, I've been involved in a lot of open source TypeScript projects, and I also build tsc.envim, which is the NeoVim plugin to run the TypeScript compiler asynchronously and catch errors. And I've also ported over Matt Pocock's VS Code extension TS error translator, or pretty TS errors. Let me uh, give you a show of um, what makes other type systems so good. So the thing that makes other type systems uh, nice is uh, generally algorithms around or based on Hindley Moner. And I'm sure all type wish can correct me in any misspoken things here, but Let's build up a intuition for how uh, a better type system could work and how it works in ReasonML and OCaml. So let's say we have this function foo and this function bar, right? Uh, Joy, can you tell me what the type of S is in this example? It is a string. Yes, exactly. What about the type of X? Correct. And what about the type of Y? Yeah, it's a name. I assume you said none, yeah. So in OCaml and Reason, there is a distinction between ints and floats. They are separate types and you can't, uh, actually I can just go back to this slide, right? So if we go look at ints and floats, right? So we have two distinct operators for operating on integers and floats. All integers have a plus and star and you know, the same for like division and all those. And then our floats have this plus dot, star dot, slash dot. Um, you can't do two types together. And now you may ask, uh, now you may ask like, what happens if I try to add a float and an int? Well, you're gonna get a type error at uh, compile time or in your editor from the LSP. This expression is type float, but an expression was expected of type int, right? Um, you can go through this later. This is just showing off uh, the language. Pattern matching, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so back to this example. You got it right. So now, like, how you subconsciously figured out the types uh, of these functions on the right is similar to how Hindley Milner works at inferring types in OCaml and ReasonML. So what's going to happen is if we consider S first, right? S gets passed to string.length. And we know from the type definition of string.length that length will only ever accept a string. It can't be passed anything else. So we can infer based on that, that S must be a string. Next to determine the return type, we can look at the return type of the string.length method. We know that this can only ever return an integer. Therefore, the return type 
of foo must be int. And the total type definition of foo is a function that takes a string and returns an int. Now for x, it gets passed to foo. We've already done the work to figure out what s is, or the first and only argument to foo is. We know it's a string. Therefore, the only, um, the only type that x could ever be is a string. For y, right, we already covered in an earlier slide that in uh, type systems like this, integers have integers and floats have their own uh, unique um, binary operators. So here we have a plus that tells us, oh, y must be in it. Plus we did the work of determining that foo returns in it. So y must be in it. Like this is exactly what your brain did subconsciously as you were figuring out and figuring out these types on your own. And finally, the return type, because the plus operator uh, only works on ints, we know it must be an int. In these type systems, we can also annotate our types, which is often a good practice, right? Like uh, for documentation or just making things more clear. Um, so we can annotate types just like this. So let's look at the same exact example, but in TypeScript. So, um, whoops, that's a little bit of a spoiler, but if you do the same code in TypeScript, the type system is going to infer S, X, and Y as any, and it's gonna give you type errors, right? Not great. But now you might be saying, oh, but Dylan, in the, um, in the reason ML example, we had a strongly typed uh, function, string.length, that uh, you know dictates that it can only take a string and returns an int. Well, I say, okay, let's replicate uh, that function. So let's make const string length and let's strictly annotate it. It can only take a string and it returns a number, da 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 da. There we have it. Yet the problem persists. Even with that, we cannot, TypeScript cannot accurately infer our types. It still infers it as any. So that's kind of my compelling brief introduction to why and how there are far better type systems out there than TypeScript. Hopefully that was somewhat entertaining and uh, educational. Okay, TypeScript, sure, TypeScript's type system is Turing complete, but just because it's more powerful, uh, I don't think makes it more practical or useful. All right, so we have this. Uh, this one actually doesn't get exported. We need to copy. TS up really annoys me because it doesn't carry the type definitions through, so I have to go through and copy and paste these and keep them in sync. And finally, deserialize canonical. Okay. That looks good. Functions describe the world. And let's add equal. All oh, right, these don't need exported. That all looks good. Are you over or under 30 years old? How old do you think I am, Burrito? I had to learn to love the Rust type system. Initially, it was painful. Now I kind of miss it in language that I use for work, Ruby and Elixir. Elixir is getting set theoretical type soon. Yep, we actually just talked about that a bunch earlier. All right, so let's go ahead and do a bun build. 
And let's go check our .dts. Okay, that looks great. I'd say 33. I am turning 31 next Friday in under a week. All right, let's get back to writing these tests. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, it's facts. Uh, okay, well, and reason ML do they do make you look younger? Also, a great reason to learn. Thank you, Joy. I super appreciate that. Even if we might not see eye to eye on uh, TypeScript, I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate you being a uh, a good sport on uh, listening to me gripe about TypeScript, my love hate relationship with TypeScript. All right, so should we make an arbitrary here? I like Spiro, I'm open minded. Good. All right, so let's give this our new types. Here is our new types and functions. Please write um, fast check tests for the um, deserialize and serialize serial functions. AI is pretty good. I wrote like a hundred some tests yesterday in our FFI library. Check this out. This is really cool. Well, this is generating. Um, I use property testing with um, fast check in TypeScript. So I wrote 106 tests, but fast check ends up doing 9,733 assertions. So it's, it's super, super nice, super powerful. And it catches stuff even in strongly typed languages that, um, that uh, type systems won't always catch, like weird edge cases. So yeah, highly recommend checking out fast check. It's like the greatest thing in the world or in your respective language, find a property testing library. Yeah, right. TD, TDD is like, you know, maybe if you're interviewing at like a big Fortune 500 or a bank or old giant institution that has like enterprise culture, maybe TDD is a thing, but all the companies I've worked at in the past basically decade with the exception of State Farm, like, no. What up, Marsk? Um, my offer should hopefully be uh, getting finalized on Monday. It was supposed to get finalized on Friday, but uh, all of the job offers for this company have to get approved by the CEO. And I it sounds like he must have got caught up with meetings and stuff and didn't get a chance to sign off on it. So hopefully Monday the, the job offers in and I can breathe a sigh of relief. I have an offer from another company and I'm expecting a third offer from another company, but that first choice company, I, I really, really want. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we don't need that anymore. We can jump back over to here and let's go to our test and let's see how Chad Chippity did. <laughs> All right, I can buy putting those two functions together. Let's uh, go ahead, throw that in and now let's code review 
our good friend um, All right, let's read through these tests. So <clears throat> describe serialize and deserialize. It should correctly serialize and deserialize atoms. Okay, we get a string. We create an atom from the string. We serialize that to an S expression. Um, that's actually incorrect. Or no, that is a string, right? Yeah. We deserialize it to a result S expression. We assume it to be true. We unwrap it. Good, good, good. That looks like a good test. Mm -hmm. Okay, that actually looks like a pretty solid test. FY regarding Moonlander, I just did a test change my switches and using different keycaps, and that made a considerable difference. So now I'm on the hunt for new keycaps. So nice. Hell yeah, Pepper. All right, let's give this test a run. Uh, first, we need to do a Dune build. That should copy over. Um, let's go to our package JSON quick. And let's add test. And that's going to be bun test. Um, where does that get pointed to? Bun run build. Let me see if that got copied over to our disk. No, we want to point it at build default dist source test. Yeah. Fun test, and then that's going to go to uh, build slash, um, let's see, dot slash build slash, it's an underscore, dist, not dist, source slash S tier test. I'm not on a Moonlander now. I'm thinking about buying a Moonlander for myself for my birthday though. Okay, we got four failing tests. So let's uh, start. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, just worry about this first test. Sounds topery. Get out of copy mode, there we go. Uh, we gotta run build again and let's do a test. Okay. So an array with an empty string failed. Glorious pandas, yep. In fact, we should go try to fix this bot real quick. Um, Z, uh, I forget what, is there a Twitch? Twitch integrations. Dir and allow. K. Uh, frack. I never remember the command to deploy. Fly control. Uh,
apply control deploy. That's a bugging bun. I reported search there. Oh, I'm still using homebrew for fly control. Should definitely move that over to Nix. What up, pick? Oh yeah, we're on the Nix train here. We're all in on Nix. Try installing Jest and rerunning your test with Bunx Jest. Okay, I'll give that a second in a, or I'll give that a try in a second. It was fun to follow your alt at Fortune. Yeah, we should be uh, working on more tomorrow, and we should be covering like uh, uh, like setting up like OCaml and Rust projects. I would guess uh, with Flakes and uh, Dev shells. Come on, fly. I believe in you. Okay, so we should be able to do like fly control logs too. All right. So I'm going to try this redeem. All right, bots back up. Great. Do I just not have logging for any of that? I must not. I should probably fix that. I should really rewrite this to uh, uh, use um, some of the stuff leandro has been working on with Riot. But yeah, you guys can wager a thousand points to uh, try to win a Keychron. If you win, I'll ship you one. All right, we can get out of this now. So Char is saying to try Jest for string concatenation monoid. So what exactly is breaking then, Char? So we're failing on, oh, I bet like an empty string just isn't a valid S expression. Um, filter, well, let's see if we can give it something. Constraints. There, let's try that. Right, I have to build every time I do this. This is annoying. Bun run build. Still failing. Oh my god. <laughs> this is so annoying. I've got to have some sort of constraint on here that is not just an empty string. Uh, hold on, I know how to filter, stir, um, stir dot trim uh, does not equal. Uh, 
Let's try that. So we still failed. Shouldn't it? That just not save properly. Um. Oh, my God. Give me words. Well, I, I guess this is actually a good test, right? Because these are good tests. Because that's not a valid atom. Can we do lorem? I just want a word. Can I do word? Arbitrary char. No, no, no. Yeah, we could do that. I'm just surprised there's just not like a word in here. Yeah, we'll do, we'll just do lorem. And what's that take? Constraints. Uh, let's just say two. Uh, does that have a min? No. That looks good. Now we can go. All right, so we failed there. All right, because that would deserialize to a list. I don't use any uh, debuggers, generally. If I do, it's like in Node and I just attach the Chrome debugger.
Don't skip. Where are we skipping tests? Cannot find S tier MJS. Why? Whoops, that's the wrong path. Where did we get failures from? Oh, we need to ignore. We need to ignore the two tests. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Okay, how do we configure this? Uh, let's see here. Um, bun docs. We want to filter. So what is it, bun run test? That's what's going to get us the right one? All right, so now we want to um, thank you for the subscription, the Marskill. World. Super appreciate you. Uh, valid um, S expressions. Updated test. Let please write tests to test for invalid S expression S expressions. Invalid uh, strings for creating S expressions. Thank you for the follow, Axelot. The world. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, here we go. That's the kind of shit we wanted to spit out. All right, so let's check the test it just gave us. It should return an error for strings with unbalanced parentheses. Great. Should be an error, perfect. Should return an error for strings with illegal characters. Sure. 
Um, let's go ahead and say Functions empty strings. Describe the world. Should return error for empty strings. Then we don't need uh, a property test for this. We'll just write a normal test. Um, I mean, sure. What up, Purple Elf? Thank you for the raid so much. Super appreciate you. How was your stream today? Y'all, if you don't follow Purple Elf, super should. Her stream is super wholesome and educational and good vibes all of the time. Highly recommend. I'm doing quite well. We are working on writing TypeScript to avoid writing TypeScript. Expect. Yep, so that should be good. And then let's make the same exact test, but for um, strings with only spaces. All right, let's go ahead and run our new tests. And what's crazy for that last test, just those two test cases, our property testing library ran 400 assertions on those tests. Like for writing two tests, we got actually 400 tests. That's what makes property testing so amazing. Thank you for the follow, Tobbs. But yeah, you were definitely already following me. I believe you, for sure. Sir Fuggington, also thank you for the follow. Appreciate all of you. Y'all are what make this stream what it is. So let's bun, run, build. Um, Brown Hounds, are you asking about property testing? Is that what you want me to expand on? Or do you want me to expand on the part where we're writing TypeScript so we don't have to write TypeScript? <laughs> All right, so we have three failing tests and we're failing on should return an error for incorrectly formatted expressions. The TypeScript part, sure. So we are writing this underlying library called Melange FFI. Melange is a compiler for OCaml and ReasonML that compile um, them to JavaScript. So it lets us write OCaml or ReasonML. ReasonML is just an alternative syntax for OCaml that looks closer to JavaScript. Um, and it compiles it out to um, JavaScript. Why would we want to do that? Um, OCaml's and ReasonML's type system is much uh, more ergonomic and type safe and actually sound when compared to TypeScript. So it gives us a greater sense of type safety it has amazing type inference. You can pretty much write an entire program without annotating any types, and the type system will infer the correct types for you. Um, generally, you still want to annotate types uh, in some places, especially like at uh, your like library or API uh, boundaries, just for good documentation and like you know, you know, it just helps understand what you're working with without having to look at hover docs. Um, so that's kind of why we would want to use OCaml and ReasonML. Um, so what Melange FFI is, is rather than writing, um, when you want to bind to like an NPM package from Melange, you write these things called uh, externals and bindings, which end up looking like this. And there's a bunch of these like annotations that you have to use that are basically like macros in OCaml and ReasonML. And Sometimes it can get pretty uh, unergonomic and boilerplate -y to write some of these um, bindings. Like, let me scroll down here, find a good example. Like just stuff like this, like you, especially when you get to like, um, let's see, like curried functions and uh, functions that might throw, things like that. It can get really difficult to write some of these externals sometimes. So what Melange FFI is aiming to be is we ported Melange's runtime or the entire standard library to JavaScript. 
and we are making this nice little thin um, wrapper layer that exposes OCaml and ReasonML's runtime types um, as a JavaScript library. So you can see kind of what our types look like in here. Um, this isn't the best example because we're looking at the worst of it. Um, let's see here. We have things like results and options and lists, which are linked lists rather than arrays. We have a bunch of helper functions to help work with that stuff. Um, and um, so the idea is rather than binding directly to like a third party NPM package, you would write a tiny little FFF or FFI file with Melange FFI and you would shape that library's types and functions to OCaml types with this library in JavaScript before writing your external bindings. Um, and when you do go to write your externals, it's gonna be way easier, way more ergonomic. You're not gonna to have to use a, a dozen different annotations. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the high level idea. And then where all of this started was an even further underlying um, premise is we're trying to write a plugin for V that can compile Melange um, and run it in watch mode for V. And to do that, we're going to talk to Dune, which is OCaml and ReasonML's um, build tool. And when Dune's in watch mode, it spins up an RPC server. And that RPC server communicates via S expressions. So S tier is a port of an OCaml library for parsing and deserializing or serializing and deserializing S expressions. Um, so this is all in service of building a, a V plugin at the end of the day. I actually gave a conference talk recently on uh, Melange, OCaml, and ReasonML. I'll throw that link in the chat if you're interested. I'm actually giving it again in DC at Front Runners uh, JS conference in like a month. So if anyone's in the DC DMV area, you know, tickets aren't super expensive. Come on out. Okay, so let's figure out why our tests are failing. So this is passing. We know these are passing, or sorry, this one. So we'll skip that. And we know that's passing, so let's skip that. Mm -hmm. If you're ever in the New York, New Jersey area, I'll hit it up. Mm -hmm. I do know some of the people in the Remix run team and um, uh, two or three of them speak at a, a dev conference in Philly every year that I might try to submit something to next year. And let's just start a skip on this. Can close that and let's go ahead and bun run build. So we fail on this. So it's an empty string. But what the hell is that? It's an empty string and a comma. Oh, sweet Diva, that's awesome. The world. Thank you for the follow, Mao Mao. Appreciate you. To return an error for strings with unbalanced. Oh, well, it ended up making it balanced. <laughs> Duh, hold on. Oh, 
Oh, can I give this, actually, let's see if we can give it a constraint where it's like a, no. All right, so we do need to filter. All right, let's see if that works a little bit better. This is bun test. In fact, in fact, a lot of this library is written in OCaml. So that's the another, I think you need to figure out the ones that contain not just a single, oh, good luck. Good luck, Prophet. Um, but a side effect of writing Melange FFI is that you can also uh, compile any OCaml library that doesn't have system calls to JavaScript and then, or really, you can write, you can write an entire JavaScript library in OCaml and then just write a thin JavaScript wrapper layer, which is exactly what this file is, and then publish it to NPM. So you can effectively publish like TypeScript libraries with OCaml using Melange FFI as just a thin layer for the outside API, which is exactly what S tier is, which I think is super cool. I didn't, that was not like my goal when I started writing this, but then I realized that we could basically go in the other direction too, which now like I'm basically any, anything I build for the TypeScript ecosystem, I'm just gonna use Melange for in OCaml, compile it down, build a nice JavaScript ergonomic API in front of it with Melange FFI and ship it. Uh, Stafford, my theme is um, Capuchin Macchiato. Right, we need to go do what Prophet just said, and that is Yeah, so um, I'm actually trying to interview with the Remix team. I, uh, I've been, I shot uh, Michael Jackson an email from a referral earlier this week. But Pedro, who I've had on the stream before, Pedro Katori, uh, the video is on YouTube. He does a lot of the Vite work, um, and him and another guy um, are largely responsible for getting the spa mode shipped. Um, Pedro's gotten into OCaml over the past couple months and, um, uh, Pedro would probably be interested in working with me to write remix bindings, especially the spa mode, um, uh, bindings. So I think that would be really cool. So this needs to be dot as it includes, yeah, I get that backwards every freaking time. Oh, for real? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't even think I'm, let me see if I can go disable that on stream elements. I think Kyle set that up. Okay, theme should be off.
Damn, Diva, going freaking wild. Thank you so much. All right, it should not work now. Yeah, there we go. So let's run build, and then we'll do a bun run test. There we go. Lovely. Well, I guess we should flip this to only now. All right, so now we're failing here on a empty string, of course. Wait, why is that still running? Unbalanced parentheses. I thought we'd skip that. I should have just wrote my own arbitrary here at this point, but whatever. And string dot trim does not equal that damn some Hollywood undead this must be like this must so I transferred all my uh, Spotify songs to Apple music and like this must be picking up my likes from like high school on Spotify All right, so what are we failing on here? Right, empty strings. Although that should be what we're putting under test, isn't it? Yeah, let's just go ahead and filter this. What are we failing this time? A star. Why can't I not skip this song? Oh. I was in high school, CDs became a thing. So a star must be a valid S expression character. Well, I guess we can just, um, it's
I think the last test case probably covers this for us. I graduated in 95. I was born in 93. Dang, we are still... Oh yeah, I don't think that's an invalid S expression string. There we go. Okay, great. Delete to parentheses, thank you. All right, let's run the whole test suite. Sweet, okay, there we go. So let's teach ChatGPT that. Here's what our test suite ended up looking like for uh, serialize and deserialize. I'm gonna grab another drink, I will be right back. Uh, don't need this. Do it, All right. Yeah, whatever. I don't care. Dude, ChatGPT drops connections all the time on me. More of a frappe than macchiato. Is frappe the white theme? Or the light theme? Oh no, okay. Latte's the, the light theme. I don't like the light theme at all for cappuccino. Okay. ChatGPT is literally just dead. What happened? Is ChatGPT down? GPT down. Rip. All right. Um, the font is Mono Lisa. Yep. Dude, it used like two months ago, it was like impeccable. Now it's just like horrible. I wonder Oh, 
Oh, fuck. I'm still on the wrong page. Do I just need to close that Chrome tab and do a new one? My guy. I use Mona Lisa and Cappuccino Mocha. Let's go. Great combo. <clears throat> Okay, so I can get here. This is so stupid. Did I get like rate limited? openai.com login uh, uh, what the frack is my password what up juice box what up raiders oh my god diva you are going insane right now thank you so much so Raiders, we are working on writing some property tests for a TypeScript library called S-Tier. S-Tier is a library that's partially written in OCaml and compiled to JavaScript. And it is really the only JavaScript library that does serialization and deserialization of S expressions and canonical S expressions. And this is... Uh, part of a ecosystem of libraries I'm working on in TypeScript so I don't have to write TypeScript anymore. So I can exclusively write OCaml. Nice, Juicebox. Well, welcome, y'all. Yeah, so we're working on writing this S expression library called S tier, which we compiled to very popular OCaml libraries down to JavaScript and then wrapped it with our little FFI library. And um, S tier is going to be used to build Functions an RPC server in TypeScript to power a Vite plugin for compiling uh, OCaml code to JavaScript. It's going to communicate with Dune, which Dune is OCaml's build tool. And when Dune's in watch mode, it spins up this little RPC server. And that RPC server communicates via S expressions. And there was just like no good libraries in NPM for S expressions. So we did it ourselves. Thanks, Juicebox. I have a tiling window manager installed. I, <laughs> I have it. It's here. Don't worry. I just... Uh, Instinct. Why are you manipulating S expressions? Because I need to communicate with a RPC server that's communication format is S expressions. Is this gonna get its act together yet? There we go, we're back. Yeah, Time Panini, if you like options, you're gonna love Melange and OCaml and ReasonML. I have a whole library of OCaml types in um, TypeScript. Yeah, we've got results, uh, we've got options, we've got a really ergonomic API that is closer to what a JavaScript or TypeScript developer would expect. Um, yeah, it's really good. If I full screen this and we look at the um, symbol outline, you'll see like the API. So we have, okay, error, is okay, is error, two option, map, then unwrap or unwrap. We can jump to our option type, right? Same deal over here. Sum, none, is sum, is none, map, then unwrap. 
we have a linked list. Uh, we don't have an actual implementation of either. Um, we could, um, maybe we'll add that at some point. So Melange, Panini is a compiler for Java or OCaml and ReasonML to JavaScript. I did not, see, so I'm not the creator of Melange. I'm a user of Melange. The library we're making is Melange FFI. And this library is inspired by another language called Gleam, which we'll get to. So Melange is just a tool for compiling OCaml and ReasonML to JavaScript. Melange FFI is a TypeScript library to make writing bindings between OCaml and JavaScript libraries easier. Um, and it's super, super inspired by Gleam. So Gleam is a language that's being worked on right now. It's not a 1.0, but it looks like Rust and it has a type system like OCaml and ReasonML, or at least similar. Um, so it compiles to Erlang or JavaScript and they have this super nice uh, JavaScript library that mirrors all of Gleam's standards library types and makes writing FFIs easier or bindings to JavaScript easier. So I'm, I'm copying that from Melange and OCaml. Yeah, I do a ton of streaming in OCaml. Um, I made this, um, if you're looking to get started with Melange and ReasonML and OCaml, I built Create Melange App which is a, the easiest way, in my opinion, to get started um, with it. It's inspired by Create T3 app. Um, if you generate a project with it, it's gonna have a ton of resources and help and explanation of what's going on. Gleam is fully inferred typing, yep. So this is like the kind of project that it'll spit out. So if you run Create Melange app, this is what you'll get. Um, it has a description of what every directory is, um, where to get help, how to learn OCaml. Um, if you go look in here, you can see we have a React app in uh, ReasonML and OCaml. It has comments explaining all the syntax, what's going on here. Yeah, so would love if y'all try it out. <laughs> you gotta be wicked smart, much respect. I wouldn't say I'm wicked smart. I am building off the shoulders of giants. And um, I like using Melange and OCaml, so I'm building the tools that make my life easier to use the stuff that's built by the wicked and smart people. And I shared this link earlier, I think before the second raid got here, but I gave a conference talk on Melange uh, a couple months ago. I'm actually giving a Another variation of it in um, Washington, D.C. in a month. World. So if you're in the DMV area, check out Front Runners Conference. Uh, thank you for the follows, David, Z Snails, and Time Panini. Appreciate all of y'all. And if you're looking for help in any of this stuff, like feel free to stop by stream and ask or uh, join our Discord. Definitely more than happy to help. So right now we're having ChatGPT Chat GPT help generate some tests for us. Next, let's generate tests for um, canonical dot serialize and canonical dot deserialize. Turn off that and let's jump back to S tier. Um, we want to go to here and grab this guy. Hopefully that spits out some fast, some solid tests for us. Let's listen to some Bryce Vine. Uh, 
Melange is the spice from Dune. You're right. And O'Camel's build tool is named Dune. <laughs> this isn't what we want. We're going to have to write this ourselves. Favorite song. What a bad cop. Would you recommend going through some functional programming theory before diving into coding or would you just start coding and figure things out as required? 100%. I think the best way to learn OCaml is just start building something you think is cool. It might be against what a lot of other people in chat might think, but like doing like a lot of people this year did advent of code with OCaml and I think I don't think that gives a fair shake at how good OCaml can be. I think OCaml is really good at building like command line applications or web servers, um, REST APIs. Um, yeah, exactly. Like I'm, I am just now a year and a half after learning OCaml, starting to actually read literature and papers and books on actual type theory. I do not have a strong background in mathematics or type theory or category theory or any of that. Um, but by being in this area, like it, it's perked my interest in that stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got some experience with Rust. Will that help me out with OCaml? Yeah, I think having experience with Rust will um, uh, make learning OCaml easier. The original um, Rust compiler was written in OCaml. And I would say like the best parts of the OCaml language, like things like pattern matching, options and results, like that was all largely inspired by OCaml and all of that is in OCaml. Yeah, so let me see if I can show you one of my OCaml projects here. So this project is a, a tool to transfer playlists between Apple Music and Spotify. Uh, let me see if I can find like some good code to show you. The redirect server is a pretty cool one. Yeah, it's fine. So this is what OCaml looks like. Um, actually, let me get the language server working. Uh, redirect server. I probably am not built. That's probably the problem. Oh shit, uh, this is not in a state that's working right now. Either way, oh yeah, if you know F sharp, picking up OCaml is gonna be super easy for you. Yeah, so yeah, if you know and like F-sharp, you're gonna love OCaml. And there's some really cool stuff happening in OCaml right now. Um, one of our friends, Leandro, is working on this framework called Riot. And Riot, if you're familiar with Erlang and Elixir and OTP, 
Riot is a basically uh, OTP for OCaml. Uh, so basically you can spin up like hundreds of thousands or you know millions of green threads. And um, yeah, it's have supervisors and gen servers and all that stuff in OCaml and have it all be type safe too. So we're going to be rewriting create Melanjap to uh, another library by uh, Leandro called Mint-T. Mint-T is built on top of Riot and uses the Elm architecture. Fun fact, F-Sharp was originally meant to be a .NET port of Haskell, but getting .NET to play nicely with laziness didn't really work out, so they chose OCaml as a base language instead. Yeah, watching Leandro is an incredibly talented engineer. He does stream. He streams really often, actually. If you want to catch uh, notifications for him, there's a bunch of OCaml streamers in our Discord, kind of all working on related projects to make the ecosystem better. His uh, Twitch channel is uh, probably just uh, Leo Stera on Twitch, right? Twitch.tv slash Leo Stera. Yeah. Give him a quick shout out. So yeah, we've got a bunch of really cool, fun, and interesting stuff happening in the OCaml ecosystem, and a bunch of people are streaming it. Yeah, I don't know how it's worked out. Somehow, a bunch of people who love OCaml have kind of just found each other and want to make the ecosystem better, and it's been really, really fun building together. So we need to copy this. We're gonna use this as our test case. Yoink. <laughs> Let's wrap this in another describe. And we'll say this is gonna be uh, S expression. That's not what I wanted. Trash puppies here. Someday we'll convert trash puppy to OCaml, just like bad cop. So now let's copy this same block and we're gonna write the same test, but for uh, canonical S expressions. Panini, the first thing I did on stream today was record a walkthrough of my entire NeoVim config. Um, I will hopefully have that video edited and posted like early this coming week. Um, I will, let me write a little note to myself. I'll DM you on Discord since you just joined when it's done. Uh, is your is your handle on Discord Time Panini too? It is cool. DM Time Panini uh, new in video, but my dot files are uh, gonna be at. 
I have a dot files repo that I need to probably deprecate. I started using Nix in the past month, um, but I still manage NeoVim pretty normally. Um, so if you just look at this directory and down, it's gonna look like a totally normal NeoVim configuration. And a lot of it's commented. So hopefully that's helpful. What do you use to deploy to prod? Um, for my personal projects, I've been using um, fly.io recently. Um, they've been great. Um, and then depending, I did, I did consulting for quite a couple years and there was a combination of everything. I've worked with uh, Azure, GCP, AWS. Most of it was using Terraform and stuff, but I don't love DevOps shit at all. I actually detest doing DevOps stuff, but um, yeah, fly.io for my personal stuff is super easy. I use Supabase a lot um, for database stuff. It just makes it easy. I would potentially give SST a try if I needed something a little bit more complex. Um, I'm a big fan of DAXs, and uh, I think this looks like a pretty useful framework for deploying uh, to D AWS. I actually think it would be cool to um, write, <laughs> write uh, melange bindings for SST, but, you know, I use Docker, Nginx, Reverse, uh, yeah, I've used Docker and Nginx before. I actually think instead of Nginx, I would use Caddy. Um, I used Nginx a lot, like close to a decade ago. And then I started using Caddy for my reverse proxies and Caddy is just a lot easier to configure in my opinion. <laughs> doll is super sweet i haven't had a chance to use doll for anything real but the idea of doll is Functions very attractive to me the world and um i wish i could write my dune files with doll in fact if i get time in like i don't know once we get past a bunch of this work once we rewrite create Melange app to native OCaml and Mint T and we ship our, Vi our V plugin for Melange, I might try to get Doll to compile to um, Dune files or S expressions. I mean, I think we could probably hack it pretty easy now while type Twitch because... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can this compile to JSON? It can. So hear me out. A super MVP version of configuring Dune with Doll could be compiling to JSON, reading the JSON in, using S tier to convert it to an S expression, and then writing the Dune file. Like we could do that probably pretty easily and pretty quickly. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, maybe if I get a little burnout from some of this stuff, we'll, we'll play with that one day. Or if someone else wants to pick it up, all the pieces are in place to make it happen pretty easily. <laughs> it's so ridiculous that that would work. Uh, I'm not even mad about it. All right, so to correctly deserialize and deserialize. So when we serialize that, we're going to say, this is gonna be canonical, not serialize. 
<laughs> Let's actually, um, I don't want to get in the business of writing a custom um, arbitrary here. So I think I'm going to drop fast check for this test. And we're just going to use um, this example here. So it'll be a result. So then we say expect um, result that is okay to be true. And then um, expect, is it gonna figure this out? We need to re-serialize it. That's not this test. So then let's copy that, paste that there. And we can comment these for now. There we go. It's the fun you enable from having small sharp tools. That's honestly, I'm picking up a lot of that from Leo too, like watching him decompose the itty bitty parts of Riot down to useful reusable libraries. That That's like top of my mind when I'm building a lot of this stuff now. This will be serialized to equal canonical S expression to equal. All right, let's say this is going to be a, we'll skip this. And then this will be only, I don't think we need to do both, but fun was being a little bit weird about that the other day. So let's try that. <clears throat> and now let's pop open this, bun run build and bun run test. Zero pass and zero fail. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> Looks good to me, ship it. Okay, well, those two tests passed. <laughs> okay, now let's uncomment out these and do the rest. <laughs> Try 
should properly serialize and deserialize lists. Um, that's not super important in this case. I mean, we can, we effectively have that tested already. Should return an error for strings with unbalanced parentheses. Well, let's look at this last test again. Yeah, I guess we can keep this actually. So this is a thought I have too, is if it's worth having different types once they've been deserialized as, I don't know if that's worth it because a deserialized canonical S expression is just an S expression. It's not like there's no difference from a an S expression and a canonical S expression when it's at runtime, it's when they serialize to a string. That's what's different. So I think I might drop this type. Hmm. Yeah, so a canonical S expression, uh, Alice is, um, let me jump back to the test here. So a normal S expression just serializes to something like, actually it's gonna be easiest to look over here. So a normal S expression would serialize to this and a canonical serializes to this where it has basically the length of the atom and then the atom value and then just it that it just condenses it and um, basically just a condensed format wired format but once they get parsed back into memory they are just comprised of the same variants, which is an atom and a list of atoms. So I don't think it makes sense to differentiate the types. You should just be able to serialize as an S expression. So maybe we should change up our API here to reflect that. The round trip to serialize after serialize a property, it should equal identity, yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. That's how I think I'm gonna change the um, the API here. I admittedly, oh, what a, dev dad, I totally missed you. I'm so sorry. Thank you uh, for the three months of subscriptions. Super appreciate you if you're still around. I realized that was 10 minutes ago now. I was in the zone. So let's say if we dropped a canonical S expression. So we wouldn't need this function. Oh no, we would need this S expression, sorry. Right, because we need a differentiation between parsing a canonical and also serializing to a canonical. but they should both parse to S expressions and not a canonical S expression. Yeah, 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 okay. We don't need the second equality function. OK, 
Canonicals are a subset, I think. Serialized canonicals are a, is that true? I don't know if S expressions are sensitive to white space by their spec. Because this first one is a serialized S expression and the second one is a serialized um, canonical S expression. But if you deserialize these from strings, they're both gonna look like this structure here. Like they will, if you did like JSON that stringify on both of the structures um, of them at runtime, they'd be equivalent. Damn, we're going in FFI, you sir. <laughs> I promise what I'm doing is not that complicated or difficult. I am building on top of the complicated things. I'm putting helpful, tiny, simple tools on top of the complicated stuff that people much smarter than me built. <laughs> So we don't need this. Yeah, I think that's, in general, S expressions are not white space sensitive. Okay. See you, Joy. Thank you uh, for hanging out. Super appreciate you. Let's try running those tests. Uh, yeah. Boom, beautiful. Seven tests, but 404 assertions. Let's go. It's okay. Let's try running all of them. 13 tests, 1,006 assertions. Love to see it. <laughs> nice. All right, then we need to test, um, we should probably test Atom and list so i can write these probably on my own it should um i don't know create a valid s expression atom What did I do wrong here? Oh, missed the comma. Uh, let's say const atom equals um, atom foo, and then right, 
Um, and we'll say, I mean, we already kind of have test coverage over this, um, but let's just make some simple explicit tests. So we'll say serialized, and then we'll say expect uh, to equal, yeah. Oops, we double, how did, come on TypeScript. Freaking TS server. Wow, typo. Oh, right, it has to be a list. Pretty thocky keyboard. Thank you, thank you. My keyboard specs are there and you can also spend a thousand bytes to try to win a key crime. I'll ship it out to you if you win. Uh, this should be Adam. Tell me this isn't sick right here, chat. This is like the beauty of just having pure functions. That's, I love this. Fuck, I'm out of a drink. All right, I'm gonna go grab another drink quick. Okay, so that looks good there. Let's run the new test. All right, so we've got an error. Oh, I never updated, right, dumb. So, we are gonna work on that chart. We are gonna try to take some ideas from um, uh, Tech Savvy Travi. He wrote a, a new package called Sloth Pipe recently. A lazy evaluated chainable and reusable pipe for data transformation and processing. Um, maybe Using a binary com. Oh, okay. Never mind. Maybe I'm mixing up point three too. Point three programming. Hmm, I see. Yeah, I, I actually have, I think we can potentially get there if I'm understanding correctly. <laughs> Point for is when you use combinators to increase job security. Uh, Could have used that recently. I have some to-dos to add to our function module. Uh, where are my to-dos in here? 
we're going to add function.flip, function.identity, function.constant, tap, and compose, and then a try catch um, to our function module. We might actually just add those before we work on the pipelining stuff because some of these could be useful for that. Um, but we got, I feel like the currying is probably the hardest part, and that's that's done. And the TypeScript is very annoying. Yeah, I mean, we're getting ready to write a compose function uh, anyways. So sounds like we're going to get there. But yeah, everyone should go give uh, Travis's sloth pipe a star. One, because the freaking logo is amazing. And it's just cool overall. All right, so we failed a test. What failed? S tier. Atom should create a valid S expression atom. And we failed. You receive foo. That's actually not what I would have expected, clearly. Is that what we would have expected? I mean, it must be because that's what the underlying OCaml library is doing. I didn't do anything to edit that. So maybe if we give it two values, I mean, this should probably possibly bomb out. Um, I think this is where dependent types could help. The answer is dependent types.
Okay, that's what I would have expected. So maybe we can make this a little bit more type safe by using a branded type. Thank you for the follow, Pablo. Super appreciate you. Okay, so that actually looks right based on the grammar described here. Okay. So parentheses, kind of, yeah. That's kind of what I'm thinking too. Like they're so similar, but like, every single tool or language or runtime or library even like takes a slightly different take on it. And it's kind of annoying that it's so simple yet there's these tiny nuances. All right, let's try that. Okay, that passed, good, good, good. Uh, describe Adam, I guess we should Adam and list. And then we want to describe of. Now this should be able to um, Hopefully ChatGPT can give us some good tests here. Uh, refresh, just close everything to the right. Here is our current test suite. Now please write fast check tests for of and equal. These are a comprehensive. Uh, 
There's of yoink and equal. Where are you at? Yoink. Come on, ChatGPT. I believe. Come on, don't choke out on me. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Gleam's really fun to write. I still think that uh, Gleam could fall into uh, the category of being a great language to teach people functional programming. Alice, if you're still here, how would you compare Gleam and uh, uh, Jesus? What's the other one? I think it also starts with a G. Grain. Because I think grain looks pretty interesting too. I'm also interested to see where uh, Eduardo gets taken to. I honestly don't know much about either, but grain is pretty much a subset of a camel with slightly different syntax, right? I don't know enough to say for sure. Other than having read through their website and some other stuff, like it, it seems interesting. It seems like a friendlier approach to some of this stuff. I was under the impression that grain had like linear types potentially, but I might be wrong. I think I might be wrong. <laughs> I wish, part of me wishes that Gleam, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, they all start with G. It's such a, <laughs> it's such a mix up. I wish Gleam would have focused on a native story before, um, compiling or targeting like, um, compiling to Erlang. Granule Lang. Yeah, some of this is wild and cool. I'm excited for Gleam. I think Gleam, I think, um, oh, I'm losing his name. Luis, I think. Isn't that his name? Louis. I think the design, like 
the ergonomics of the language make it really, really approachable, which I really admire. But it feels like native is going to be a thing that is going to be missing at first. But despite loving like OCaml and like ML syntax, I do really, really like, um, I do really like Gleam syntax. Well, like I would argue that like if Gleam could compile to native and have similar performance characteristics to OCaml, then you have a compelling, you basically have the, the holy grail of like Rust, garbage collected Rust, which is like, I think a ton of people would want and then add the compilation to JS story on top of it. I think that makes a pretty compelling argument for a language for like mainstream adoption, like real mainstream adoption. And also having a good WASM story already in Gleam. Like there, there's a lot of things I think that if Gleam goes right, I think it could potentially have like pretty good adoption. I think it, so like at a theoretical and fundamental level, probably not, but for an adoption and accessibility level, I think so. I think the syntax of OCaml is a huge blocker. I think if Reason ML would have came out in 2023, I think it could have like, especially that week that DHH made a big hoopla over TypeScript, I think Reason ML could have got a ton of adoption too. But I think given people's love for Rust and their desire to not always be fighting the borrow checker and also have good type inference like OCaml and ReasonML. I, I don't know. I think there's a compelling story there for Gleam. I really do. And I think their docs already indicate a really friendly approach to teaching a bunch of this stuff. I don't know. I'm excited to see where it goes. I like all around, even like things like Rocklang, like I think the next generation of languages that will be out in like 10 years from now, I think they're gonna be really awesome. And we'll all be writing Polaris for our scripting instead of Bash. <laughs> don't tell Backup, it, your secret's safe with me. We don't, we don't have to uh, let her know that Bash is going to be deprecated for Polaris quite yet. Clip it. <laughs> ah, we don't want that full block. We want this one down to here. Okay, where is these syntax errors? Um, why did you not get dropped inside there? All right, so let's skip equal for now and focus on of. Should create an atom from a single string value. String of string value serialized equals string value. Yep, we can get rid of that comment. That looks like a good test. Should create a list from an array of strings. We need to be careful there. We need to copy our filtering mechanisms. Um, we should really use this. 
or really it just should like not be parentheses or a empty string. So let's say dot filter stir stir dot trim does not equal that or or and string and stir dot includes and not stir dot includes in JavaScript. Alice, were you in here earlier or do you know about ES4, ECMAScript 4? Somebody shared this with me earlier and it blew my mind. Can I get to my history? This is actually super, super interesting. ECMAScript 4 was skipped. So we went from ECMAScript 3 to ECMAScript 5. And ECMAScript 4 had types in it. And it got shot down by Mozilla and um, who was the other company that they were saying? Mozilla and somebody else because Adobe had written the majority of the spec and the two other companies didn't want Adobe having that much say over the web. So they shot down ES4 that had like types and stuff in TypeScript or not TypeScript, JavaScript. Let me see if I can find this. ECMAScript 4, the missing version. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, it like I had no idea about this history here. There's got a, it's got a bunch of extra stuff down here too. It had basically JSX in it too. It was called E4X, ECMAScript 4 for XML. Like, can you imagine if this would have came along in like the early 2000s, how different the web would be? February 1999 was the first draft. Yeah, I had no idea about this. Let's tweet about this. I found out today we almost had types in JavaScript and JSX in the form of E4X. Check out, have you ever wondered why we went from ES3 three to ES5? Check out this article on the skipped ECMAScript spec that could have changed the web two decades ago. You know, if y'all, <laughs> yeah, Prime getting his hair dyed, lol. It's gonna be hilarious. 
you know, if you guys want to go, you know, promote the tweet, I, I'm not saying you should, but, you know, it would be appreciated. Yeah, this is like a wild story. Like, we almost had classes that were like OCaml modules. Like, oh man, so much of this stuff would have been so cool to have. Like, it would have just changed everything. We would have had a sound type system. It's all because three companies and capitalism. Fuck. He better have dyed his mustache. I'm gonna be real upset if he didn't dye his mustache. What up, Scottish? Yep, yep, exactly, Blind. I really hope that uh, that battery that Toyota is coming out with in like a couple of years just changes everything. Also, union types, right? I didn't even know those were a thing. Yeah, it like blows my, like when someone, I don't even remember who sent me that article earlier. It might have been char string. But like just knowing we were that close, it, it would have, I don't know if it would have prevented a char, but like it definitely would have made things better. Yeah, I've been I've been publishing a lot of stuff recently, primarily because um, I don't have a ton of work at work, um, and I've mostly been interviewing, job hunting, and writing open source since the beginning of the year. So I've almost had a full month of like working on open source. But hopefully that changes on Monday. Are these passing? I can't remember. We are passing. Uh, we're skipping equal though. So let's not skip equal. And let's read these tests, make sure ChatGPT did okay. Should we turn true for identical S expressions? We get a string value. Let's go ahead and copy our... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thirteen hundred assertions. Yeah, we have two hundred twenty-three lines and how many tests? Twenty tests, but we get thirteen hundred assertions. Yeah, I've in the past two weeks I've done nine technical interviews. I am on top of streaming three hours in the morning at least every day. I'm just like exhausted. I love live streaming coding, but like interviewing they're similar and I feel like live coding every morning on Twitch has definitely helped my interview skills. But man, when the pressure of actually like landing a job is there, it's so much more stressful. I should hopefully have an offer on Monday, Panini. Hopefully it's all paid off and I land at a super cool company with a super amazing team. Um, yeah, I basically have a verbal offer. I'm just waiting for the email. And a couple people in chat already know where it's at, but uh, I'll, I'll give an extra hint for people that don't know. Now nah, my current company is shutting down in March. Triangle company, it is. Very excited. The team I'll be on, uh, I got to meet the majority of the team I'm on and they are incredible. I would be so excited to work with them. <laughs> Netflix, by the way? I'm not at Vroom, no. I'm at a company called Scalum. It's a crypto company. So we just added two more tests and we got 200 new assertions. We love property testing. Okay, cool. I think we can probably publish this. 
This might be 1.0. This is probably pretty damn close to 1.0. Yeah, are we missing anything for a 1.0 in this library? Functions describe the world. Thank you for the sub, Panini. Super appreciate you. Is there anything out of a, so right now on NPM, there is no S expression library that can serialize and deserialize S, S expressions. And there's absolutely no libraries that do canonical S expressions. Um, is there anything we should add to S tier before we publish a 1.0? Did you use OCaml at your last gig? Yep, that's exactly why I, I learned OCaml. So I've been a full stack dev for the past 10 years. And uh, in December of 2022, I started a company called Scalum and their entire stack is written o in OCaml. All their backend services are OCaml. They have an Excel plugin written in OCaml. They have some web apps in OCaml. Their main web app is in TypeScript, but um, yeah, so I got hired as a front end engineer to lead the front end team. And um, if I wanted to contribute in a full stack way, necessitated learning OCaml, fell in love with OCaml and uh, the type system it offers and the rest is kind of history. This library is X rated. That would be super sweet roasted. I think as HREFs and Dave Sancho makes more progress on um, server rendering React components with OCaml and uh, they get React server components implemented, which HREFs already has an MVP of RSCs in native OCaml, which uh, for all the React devs out there, uh, let's see if I can find Dave's blog here. I always struggle to find this. We'll just go to his Twitter. If you're interested in server-side rendering React and performance is important to you, unequivocally, SSRing React with OCaml is the most performant way to do it. And by like an order of a magnitude. Uh, let's see here. Server-side rendering OCaml. I'll share this article in chat. So just to go show. And what's cool is that ReasonML, which is just an alternative syntax for OCaml, supports JSX because ReasonML was built by Jordan Walk. Jordan Walk was the person who originally created React, so has JS JSX built in by default. On top of that, there's a dialect of OCaml right now that's working its way through the ecosystem called MLX, which would write, let you write JSX in OCaml files. Um, and Ahrefs and Dave have implemented React server rendering, basically re-implemented all of React in native OCaml. So you have native compiled binaries that can run you know, on the metal, not in JavaScript, and compile server rendered React. And like, look at these benchmarks. These benchmarks are bananas. So Node.js with Express server rendering React. Request per second, 7.2K, average latency, transfers with bun gets better. And then with native OCaml, 64.8 thousand requests per second with a latency of 6.21 milliseconds, like 155 megabits per second. It's pretty bananas. <laughs> no amount of OCaml written will cleanse his soul from the sin. Listen, I think, I think React was a net positive. I am still uncertain on the future. I think uh, actually um, Ryan from the SolidJS team yesterday did a live stream where he talked about the existential problems facing web dev and it was really, really good. I, I hope it, the VOD's recorded. Um, 
I don't think the state of RSCs or the state of Svelkit or Solid Start or any of those things are where we're going to be at in two years. Um, I think it's going to look different, but I think we're playing with ideas um, that are going to make their way into all of the frameworks. Um, I think step one of making RSCs more successful is standardizing the wire format to a version spec. That way um, other languages can implement React server components. I think that's a huge blocker and I've been harping on this for like a year now is that even if languages don't have JSX in them, it would be worthwhile to let other languages support the RSC wire format because there are so many companies out there that don't have node infrastructure at all. And it's a non-starter to introduce node infrastructure, which completely rules out uh, React server components completely. Like at the moment, if you want to use RSCs, you basically either have to write OCaml or uh, introduce node infrastructure. And um, I just don't think that's a winning strategy. I think RSCs as a technology is amazingly cool. Like honestly, one of the coolest things to come out in the past decade, but I don't think I don't think where it's at right now is going to be um, enough to be like a catalyst for mainstream adoption. Yeah, as uh, Nihil said, like Ryan stream yesterday, if you're a web dev, even if you're not a web dev um, and you're just a backend engineer, I shouldn't say just, if you're a backend engineer, don't have a ton of front end experience. I think uh, if you listen to his VOD yesterday, Ryan Carniato, it will give you a lot of empathy for what the front end world is going through right now. It will give you a lot of context and um, it might paint a picture that front end is actually kind of way more complicated than it first comes off. Yeah, super interesting stuff happening. I don't think we're there, but uh, it's gonna be interesting to see where we evolve. But long story short, the best way to server side render React right now is with OCaml unequivocally. I do not know what hyperfiddle electric is. Okay. Right, back to S tier. So S tier's API, as it stands right now, looks like this. We have atom lists, which are type constructors. We have of, which gives us a way to convert a nested list of strings into an S expression. We can serialize and deserialize normal S expressions. We have an equality function, and then we have our canonical function, which um, this looks like a TS server error. Right, we got rid of that. And then this is going to be delete to s that. Okay, so we fixed that. Great. Is there anything else we need to do for a 1.0 here? We could add like searching and manipulation but that's not super important to me. I think this is ready for a 1.0. Yeah,
Front-end dev is complicated, but why use front-end languages and frameworks for back-end stuff? Um, I don't necessarily think that's what I'm advocating for. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it is not just not Node.js, right? I don't think... I don't... I would not in today's uh, world advocate straight up for running services in Node unless you absolutely had to be using RSCs. Um, I think you're going to get way better performance characteristics from running servers in um, really any other language. <laughs> Go, OCaml, Rust, Java. Um, I would love to see Wasm mature and get like really cheap um, serialization between the DOM and Wasm itself. I think that could be a compelling story and really like create the catalyst for the next step in web dev. Um, yeah, I just wish JavaScript isn't where we landed for what's in the browser. Next.js does require node. Although we could write, we could write um, OCaml bindings to Next.js on the server side and uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know, just saying. Maybe if somebody got hired by the Triangle Company and started pushing OCaml, I don't, I don't know what could happen. I think uh, the stuff that Leandro is working on and um, some of the rest of the community I think people have good ideas to make OCaml compelling. <laughs> LOL, I just figured out Triangle Company. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Like I said, I, I essentially have a verbal offer, um, but my anxiety is not going to uh, come down until there's an offer signed and it's official. It's all but official, but you know, I, I've been in positions before, namely with GitHub, um, where I had verbal offers before and then it fell flat at the very last second. So, yep, exactly, Time Panini. So we'll see what happens. I'm feeling pretty positive, but I'm also very anxious about it. All right, I think we're ready to 1.0 this. So let's write a readme. In fact, let's just have ChatGPT write our original readme. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate the well wishes. <laughs> Thank you, Nihil. Appreciate that. So we're gonna come over here and you're going to write a readme for an open source project. Here, I will uh, shut up and just let you guys have uh, a little bit of keyboard ASMR.
This is the story of my entire programming career. <clears throat> Literally, this is me in a nutshell. The fact that I've been hired at all and been able to do this professional is just unbelievable. All right. So the first example I want to give is create melange app. So let's go grab the readme, go grab the raw and here is the first. And then we're going to go grab riots. Where's the readme? Yo, Bryce Fine is so good, y'all. <laughs> oh man, I don't get paid enough with having to deal with difficult people in the industry. One thing I harp on all the time, Grumpy, is that the hardest problems in tech and software engineering are not technical or theoretical in nature. It's people, process, and organization. A hundred percent. And if you can't build strong catalytic slash soft skills and build consensus, oh my gosh, Diva. Oh my gosh. I'm floored. Thank you so much, Diva. I'm just completely wordless. Thank you so much. I appreciate you and I hope to see you around. Uh, it's been a blast having you in stream. Super stoked to hear you're writing OCaml. And yeah, let's, uh, let's rock. Oh my gosh, Panini. Y'all are ridiculous. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. You guys are super awesome. Yeah, yep, me too, Panini. I stream, uh, I don't know if I shared my normal schedule with you, but my normal streaming schedule is Monday through Friday, uh, 7 a.m. Eastern time to 10 a.m. Eastern time. I've been going a little bit longer because of, um, you know, not like job hunting and not having a ton of work to do. So uh, yeah, keep an eye out for those. Uh, on Sunday nights, I stream uh, Nick's at night with the Alt F4 stream and MetaMe, uh, which we'll be doing tomorrow night. And uh, Tuesday nights, I stream with CM Griffin. So keep your eyes out for all that content. Look at this. This is going to be a decent readme. Of course, ChatGPT crashed again. Sweet. So let's yoink this. And let's go up to there, copy that, go to our readme. And why do we have our symbol outline open? That's weird. Paste that in. And then our nifty markdown preview plugin. The Premiere. Nah, nah, nah. It's gonna be the S tier library. The S tier NPM library for S expression, serialization, and deserialization. Oh, what just happened? How did we get here? I'm lost. No, deserialization is a real word. PM PR is welcome. So our table of contents got borked. So this should probably be a double. 
maybe a triple, double, and then this is going to be that. Give you the TLDR. All right, that's a good point. Well, the T the TLDR right there is the S tier NPM library for S expression serialization and deserialization. That's the TLDR. I don't need acknowledgments. Don't really care about those. Usage examples, sure. S tier is a cutting edge library. We don't need cutting edge, that's fluff. Ecosystem for efficient and extensive serialization and deserialization S expressions. It's unique in offering both standard and canonical S expression deserialization, making it an indispensable tool for developers working with these formats. Great. That, why can't I, there we go. You need a double break. Classic BR move, yeah. You need some tool working with these formats. At its heart, S tier leverages the power of XPLib and we should add links to those. Um, so let's do, this, nope, I got it backwards. <laughs> Petition to rename BR to bruh. Yes. Is that really not gonna, there we go. So let's go grab Jane Street's repo. And then this is gonna yanks around in square brackets. Nix that, nix that. And let's go grab CS. Petition. <laughs> Amazing. Bro, why are you using this in So this, yep, okay. Nobody show bad cop that we have bash in our project right now. That that's not even important. That's a worthless section. People will know how to install. NPM dependencies. In fact, we probably don't even need this table of contents. <laughs> Back up, don't look. 
Okay, the alcohol is starting to hit. We've got a slight buzz chat. So I think when we start writing our pipelining in Melange FFI, it's going to be chef kiss. It's going to be brought to you by Balmer's Peak. Oh, yeah. Folks don't know about Balmer's Peak. The classic. We're at, we're at peak, maybe like another half of uh, an untitled art, which uh, these are the best seltzers in the freaking world, y'all. If you have a chance to try or untitled art seltzers, they're so good. Never, Trash Puppy. I would never be tipsy on stream. That's just so incredibly inappropriate for a family friendly stream that's why we don't say um vs bleep here very family friendly don't think we really need the examples uh, maybe we could give good examples sensitive serialization and deserialization handle these canonicals offering this feature. So let's make this a bulleted list. Yeah, they do. Surprisingly, like they don't taste like fruity static. I'll put it that way. They actually taste like fruit. It's they're really good. Okay, so here let's get in this. JavaScript. Can't believe it's not fruit. That's not the right API. Exclamation point accountage. I don't know what that command's supposed to do. So let's actually use our real world example. So let's start with deserialization. And we'll say, um, and let's jump to our test file. Which is going to be, um, I've only been streaming for, I started streaming the last week of uh, September. So I've only been streaming for a couple months. I have, I want to, once um, Leo is working on publishing a uh, OCaml Twitch client, client built on um, Riot, and he's uh, going to steal all of the work from Ryan Winchester's work on his Elixir client, and once that's done, I'm gonna rewrite my uh, my Twitch client that's currently in TypeScript uh, to the OCaml version. So I'm trying not to do like a ton of work 
on my Twitch integration or my Twitch bot or whatever, I do want to add uh, capabilities for getting like the current playlist and changing songs and stuff for chat. But um, beyond that, I'm not going to do a ton of work until uh, Leandro is done copying Ryan Winchester. Just use the Elixir one, damn it. Listen, Ryan, if you come on stream with me and help me set it up, I'll do it. Like sometime in the next couple of weeks, we'll do it and you can help me set it up and deploy it to fly.io. I'm in then. I will inevitably replace it with the right version, but I will gladly write some elixir with you. All right. Then we'll uh, we'll figure out. I'll figure out some free time. I'll DM you on Discord sometime this week, and we'll figure out when we can make that work. Uh, where is my canonical up here? We want to grab um, this guy right here. Yank surround around that with that. Great. How's that look in, did we lose our markdown? We did. Markdown preview. Good. Great. Why is that happening? One, two. No, stop. This is so stupid. Does everyone see this? This is stupid. Am I dumb? There we go. Gonna be method name. Describe the Thank world. you for the follow, Wesin. Super appreciate you. And then it's gonna be um, initialize Dune version will be three dot thirteen, and then we have. protocol version, which will be 0 .0 0.0.1. And we have that. And then we can probably, hmm. There we go. Star. All right, let's see how that looks. There we go. Nice. All right. Um, let's... Is there an emoji that has like a, do we have an emoji that has an S? Or a parenthesis? Not really anything good. 
All right, so let's um, go in here and we're gonna say generate a logo in the same spirit as the as the attached uh, logo uh, for a s expression parsing library in JavaScript TypeScript based. This is the readme for the project. And then let's go attach Riot's logo, maybe, or Minty's. Let's see what we get, chat. Can chat jippity pull through? That's pretty good. That's pretty good chat. I'm not gonna lie. I'm kind of impressed with what chat just spit out here. Not gonna lie. All right, um, cool. Let's get some more parentheses. I don't even know how to spell parentheses. I got it since it's parsing S expressions. Come on, ChatGPT, I believe. <laughs> nope, that's garbage. 
make sure that the text S tier is in the logo. I might just grab this one. I kind of like this one. It's super simple. Definitely can tell it's AI, but like, come on. For a simple open source project though, pretty good. We'll give it one more try. All right, this is taking forever. Let's just commit this to GitHub and we'll see where it gets. Uh, add tests plus readme. Push. And we can do bun run build. Just make sure everything's still working. Great. I love that we have 1500 tests for that little effort. It's amazing. Oh my God, Chad Jippity. I also don't want these ones. Let's uh, find a better emoji to work with here. Okay, I can't open my emoji keyboard over there. I totally know what we should use as the logo. Uh, S drawing from middle school in the 90s. Let's fucking go. This has to be in it. It has to be in it, right? Like it has to be part of the logo. God, of course, ChatGPT can't get its shit together. What up, Lady Blue Notes? How are you doing this lovely evening? We're only doing uh, the most professional things on stream this evening. We would never do anything unprofessional.
I uh, I have a Elgato face cam. It's like a hundred bucks. I'm not hammered, trash puppy. First of all, I might have drank a little bit, but I'm definitely not hammered. Sarah told me I had to come here to see your camera quality because it's so crisp. Here we are. Welcome to stream. We're working on publishing version 1.0 of S tier, which is a library that uh, is a combination of OCaml and JavaScript and TypeScript for uh, serialization and deserialization of S expressions and canonical S expressions with the underlying premise to help us write a V plugin to compile OCaml to JavaScript and talk to Dune, which Dune is OCaml's build tool, which when it's in watch mode, spins up an RPC server that communicates over sockets via S expressions. Turns out there's no good S expression libraries in the NPM ecosystem. So uh, we did it ourselves. Yeah, we're working on <laughs> making the logo and I just had this great idea of using the S that we all drew in like elementary and middle school in the 90s uh, or early 2000s. Or maybe like, I don't know if you guys are Zoomers. I don't know if you, ha if the Zoomers had the cool S, you know, but us millennials or elder millennials had a, had this still being used. Sick. I have the Elgato face cam, but I didn't like it. I have the Elgato face cam and then I have two of the Elgato, um, I forget what the name of the lights are, but I have one light here and one light to my right. And um, yeah, it seems to work pretty well. And chat Jippity is just dying on me right now. Let's bump this size up. Oh, perfect. The hell is this? Uh, let's use the brush instead. Oh, it's because, yeah, right. It's not quite what we want. Hard tip. Oh yeah, there we go. Beautiful. I say we ship it. Oh my God, trash puppy. You're trash. Trash is in your name. Tell me this isn't beautiful. There is no A. What do you mean there's no A? There's not an A in this. Where do you see an A? Oh, come on. Oh, because it's in a freaking image tag. Are we really gonna do this right now? Is this how we're gonna play? All right, we're gonna just go ahead and say, throw in an image tag, source is gonna be And we'll give it an alt tag. The best or the most S tier logo of all time. Oh, frick. Frack. We need a break. We need some break tags in here. Some bra tags. Bruh. Wait, that is not the image I just screenshot. Let's just go ahead and like collapse this down. Actually, we should 
Move this up top. Oh, that's not what we want either. Shit. Nope, that's not what we want. Just want to move this over. Why can't I grab it? Do that, and then this layer, this layer. How do I unlock? There we go, that's better. Now let's uh, change the background over here to white. Boom, and let's flatten the image. And let's export it. File, export as a PNG. This is so good. This is the best logo I've ever created. So let's go to Explorer, Downloads, S tier, and then we're gonna cock, dude, it's, it's the best logo of all time. My mom was a first grade teacher for 35 years and from years uh, 10 to 35, she regularly told me that her first graders had better handwriting than me. So that's actually accurate. It's good, it's good. It set the width to like 600. There we go. And let's change the emoji. We need a better emoji. What emoji do we use for this? Maybe we don't need, let's just, uh, yeah, let's not even like have that. Let's just get rid of this and then we'll just uh, make this a div and we'll center it. That's not a div, also not a div. And that's wrong. And we can make this a H2 maybe? And we can get rid of PR's welcome. Great. Ship it, baby. Love it. It's so good. Let's grab that and do that. Are we not gonna freaking okay, freaking HTML. That's not what I would have expected. Whatever, we don't need that.
Okay, whatever, that's good enough. Let's pull our changes. And then let's publish. Um, npm, let's build a new binary, npm for bun run build. And we'll say bun run publish. No, we're not publishing a patch. We're going 1.0. Let's go to our package JSON. Let's just make sure I didn't fuck anything up here. Help, I don't know what I did. All right, nothing's different, great. One dot oh. Uh, we'll do one more bundle and let's just go ahead and run our test to make sure No failures 1500 assertions What is our difference here? This is probably our package JSON. Yep, so let's commit that 1.0.0 git push npm publish We're gonna not accidentally leak my NPM password on stream like we did earlier today. Boom, 1.0 of S tier is published. Let's go look at NPM. Damn it. 1.0, <laughs> it's so good. The logo is so good. Uh, this is my favorite thing I've ever written, ever. All right, let's go uh, tweet it out. Announcing S tier. 1.0.0, the, let's just grab shit from the readme. Functions describe the world. This is, this is what you get when you come here, Nihil. This is, this is the vibes of this stream. How long have I been here? Nightshade dude. You've been here since the beginning of time. You are a constant in the universe of tech twitch. We'll grab that. And then we'll uh, go ahead and say, boom. And then we'll grab the features. S tier offers extensive. Functions describe the world. Thank you for the follows, uh, Rico and Ryan Weed. You need help? Oh boy. What's wrong, Ryan Weed? I also. Uh, need help, like lots of it, but uh, here we are. Okay, that's too long. Announcing the S tier uh, npm slash TypeScript. TypeScript library for S expression serialization. And we'll say including canonical S expression. Canonical S expressions for S expression serialization. serialization. Check it out here. And then let's grab a link to the Rebo.
I've been all over time place with coding and I told myself I can do it, but I have taken many chances to learn, but my body just can't handle it. Your body can't handle it. Um, I think my general advice would be stop following tutorials online and pick a language and stick with it and build something that you find interesting and cool and just struggle through it. It's the only way you're gonna learn and get better at programming is getting out of tutorial hell and building something you think is cool and fun that keeps you engaged. And every time you run into something you don't know how to do, Google it, ask on Twitter, discords, forums, and just struggle through it. That's kind of just how we all learned for the most part. And let's grab our beautiful logo. No, it's nothing to with that. I'm just done. I mean, if you're done, there's not really uh, anything any of us can help with. If you're throwing in the towel, you're throwing in the towel, right? This is so good. Do I have any typos? Announcing S tier 1.0.0. The S tier NPM for TypeScript library for S expression. Serialization, just check it out here, S tier. Boom, post, ship it. Chat, again, I would appreciate any promotion that y'all would give this tweet. We shipped. Twice in a month, we shipped. How's that? The problem is I have a learning disability makes things hard to learn. I unfortunately can't fully, you know, empathize with that. I don't know what that's like. Um, that, yeah, that sucks. Uh, how much longer are you going chat, please? I'm getting ready to wrap up. <laughs> um, yeah, Ryan, just, I, I obviously, I, I can't, I, I can't understand what it's like to have a, a learning disability, but you know, I think the advice kind of still stands is just, if you're interested in programming, just keep your head down and keep trying. And even if you're at a larger disadvantage than most people, um, you've got this far in life and you've learned diff difficult things. And, uh, you know, I think with time, you could probably become a pretty good programmer too. Uh, but with that chat, we got a frack ton done today. We got a bunch of work done on Melange FFI. We shipped S tier 1.0. We got tons of testing done for S tier. Um, yeah, if I have time to stream tomorrow, which I don't know if I will or not, we're going to blatantly steal sloth pipe from tech savvy Travi and integrate it, or at least try to integrate it into Melange FFI. So we have a little bit nicer of an API for working with our results and options and lists. Um, so look forward to that. If it doesn't happen tomorrow, um, I probably won't work on the launch FFI on Monday. Monday, we're gonna start planning the Create Melange app rewrite to native OCaml and Mint T. But sometime later in the week, we will work on that. I appreciate all the uh, I appreciate all the new follows and everyone that hung out today. We've been streaming for like eight hours and 45 minutes. I'm pretty exhausted at this point, um, but yeah, made a ton of progress. It's been a lot of fun and uh, let's find somebody to raid. So Chris is the only person on and I'm gathering that he's getting ready to raid somebody else. So let's find another person in the category to raid. 
just codes. All right, let's find just codes. Twitch TV slash Jess underscore codes. Oh, that's a typo. Hell yeah, let's raid Jess codes. Let's go show Jess some OCaml love, y'all. And uh, yeah, let's go raid Jess. We'll be back either tomorrow or um, Monday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern time. Thank you again, everyone. Super appreciate all of you. Y'all are the best. All right, let's go. Let's go raid chat.